Welcome to the second day of the Uncovered conference. You can in and out loop. My name is Lutz Kinkel. I will yeah, be the moderator here in the conference hall. So good morning, everyone, or those of you who are here. Um, I will be running the workshops and panels in the other room. This second day is opened now by a speech uh, of Vera Jourova, Vice President of the European Commission. Please run the movie. Ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I would like to congratulate the winners of the so-called Impact Award and all the participants. This award shows that in the European Union we support, encourage and value investigative journalism because we understand that it is essential for democracy. Investigative journalists shed light on what some would like to stay hidden. In some countries today, it is complete darkness, no information. A few days ago, Russian independent newspaper Novaya Gazeta was forced to suspend its activities in the context of Russia's atrocious war against Ukraine. Novaya Gazeta is a journalistic institution whose investigative work is acknowledged far beyond Russia. Its name is inseparable from that of its editor-in-chief, Dmitry Muratov, who was co-awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. It is inseparable from the name of Anna Politkovskaya, who was shot dead at her apartment building in central Moscow in 2006. Five other Novaya Gazeta journalists sacrificed their lives to inform people. And it is so important to read the Russian people in these times of darkness promoted by the state propaganda. We need to do everything we can to support Russian journalists who had to leave the country to still be a voice to reach the Russian people with information. But journalists are not only killed in authoritarian states or in war zones. Journalists have been murdered here in the European Union. This is why I urge member states each time that I can to implement the recommendation of the Commission on the safety of journalists. The Commission is also working on a directive and recommendation to tackle abusive litigation against journalists, the so-called slaps. We will present this package at the end of April. Another important step is the Media Freedom Act. The aim is to have safeguards at EU level to protect the independence of the media and media pluralism. We see it more than ever Media companies cannot be treated as just another business. They deserve special protection, and this is what we are working on right now. We aim to present the Act in the summer. At the same time, we want to increase public funding for investigative journalism. We have already committed for the first time to allocate at least 75 million euros from our Creative Europe program to media freedom and pluralism projects by 2027. This includes support for cross-border investigative journalism, including via journalism partnerships. And I strongly believe that by working together across borders, media are stronger. We have seen the incredible results of cross-border investigations. I also believe that such networks and solidarity make it more difficult for states to interfere. The EU is committed to supporting investigative journalism because this is what democracies should do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vera Jourova. Right, so we'll have a panel here at 9.45 and there is also the workshop on how to take care of mental health when investigating and reporting. So if you want to do that, please switch rooms and go to the other one. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We'll make a short break and we start in time at 9.45.
Welcome to the first panel at this second day of the Uncovered Conference. I would like to remind you that there's also a workshop in the press room. It's a workshop about resilience and mental health. If you want to take part, you are invited to do so. Here we are doing the panel um, about uh, the dark side of EU migration policy. Uh, it is about the uh, unnumberable losses among migrants, about the daily tragedies at the European border, about perishing children, about um, desperate parents, and a migrant policy uh, that needs to be discussed and changed if we still want to claim that integrity of human life itself is one of the most important values that we have in the European Union. Uh, Lars Böring, uh, director of uh, EJC, will host this panel. Welcome, Lars, and please start. Thank you, Lutz. Um, while the uh, computer is being installed for the presentation, um, I'm going to ask the, my uh, my guests to come to the to the well. It's not a stage, but uh, seats. Let's have a seat, and um, then I'll do a short introduction. And the format that we uh, well, I take a seat as well. The format will be that uh, we have short presentations. Um, then some questions, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back to uh, all three with some questions. But of course, also, the questions from the audience uh, present here uh, can, be, uh, can be addressed uh, at, uh, let's say, the, la the, la the last part of the, the presentation. So, um, I have to look at the order, but uh, I start in the middle, Geesje van Haren. Uh, she's run her own media organization, Verspers, for over 18 years. She's driving force of the Lost in Europe project. Um, and, and leads a growing team of journalists in, in Europe. She coordinates the research on the ground, brings the team together, works in the field, and is responsible for fundraising. Geesje also has extensive experience as a media producer in the Netherlands and teaches investigative journalism. Annie Hilton, on my far side, um, award-winning investigative journalist, magazine writer from Canada, uh, through long-form narrative writing, she seeks to create empathy and illustrate the human stakes behind key policy debates. She has been published by The New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, London Review of Books, Esquire UK, The Walrus, and many others. She's an associate professor at the Science PO uh, Paris, uh, where she teaches investigative journalism. And to my left, uh, Judith Chetri. Do I pronounce? That's, That's a good right. pronoun. There you go. I practiced. Uh, Paris-based futures writer and audio documentary producer. She mostly covers labor issues, public policies, and business stories. Her documentaries have been broadcast on public radio, France Culture, France Inter, podcast Louis, Louis Media, Le Monde, and her writing in news magazines, uh, Capital Le Monde Diplomatique, Canard et Jeune, Neon, and specialized publications. She's a member of the Journalist Freelancers Collective, Extra Muros. Um, Geesje, I would like you to go to the, to the, to the stand and uh, tell us uh, a bit more about your work. And after that, I will ask you to sit down and have some questions for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lars. Thank you for the introduction. Um, to know where to click. Ah, there I am. Um, yeah, Lost in Europe. Uh, my name is Gees van Haren, project uh, coordinator of Lost in Europe, which is a cross-border journalism project investigating the disappearances of child migrants in Europe. Uh, we work in 12 countries now with journalists who are specialized uh, in high ethic codes towards the story of the vulnerable children that we investigate. Um, we started, uh, my text is, text is not here. Um, it's a blank sheet. So I have to uh, t uh, talk you through. We started with three bullet points. <laughs> they were filled in <laughs> with uh, the action plan against migrant uh, smuggling uh, that uh, started in uh, 2015. Uh, in October 21, a report was published by Archie Porcaroso and Alarm Phone, and I will t tell you about uh, their findings. And um, 
we also uh, pulled in our um, uh, focus on miners, the last in Europe focus. Um, About this action plan against migrant smuggling, the EU has set up an agenda for migration and it identified the fight against migrant smuggling as a priority. I quote when they say that they uh, created a strategy towards the eradication of trafficking in human beings. That is what they um, installed and this action plan was established for the first time in a comprehensive and multidisciplinary uh, EU approach. A great goal as it is, it has a great risk in itself. And about this risk, a report came out and it's called From Pri a Sea to Prison and that was published by Archie Pocarosso and Alarm Phone in October 21. And this report, oh, I keep on, uh, yeah, this report, it's this report. Uh, and that stated that uh, more than uh, 2,500 migrants have been arrested in Italy for people smuggling or aiding illegal immigration in the last 10 years. Hundreds of them are serving or have served long prison sentences based on anti-mafia laws and uh, to find them guilty. And the report highlights the criminalization of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers in Italy. In 2021, the Italian police have arrested one migrant out of every uh, hundred arriving on its shores and uh, they uh, uh, punish them of uh, crimes that can lead up to 15 years in prison and fines of millions of euros. In some cases, NGOs point out if deaths occur during the journey, uh, sentences escalate to as much as 30 years of life in prison. We published about these findings in ANSA. This was done by Cecilia Ferrara, our Lost in Europe um, um, journalist in Italy. This was uh, published about in El Mundo by uh, Rosa Meneses. She's also a Lost in Europe um, journalist. And we published about it in uh, the BBC World News uh, f uh, in a radio broadcast done by uh, Ismael Ainash, uh, which is called Focus on Africa. Because our focus is on minors, we looked at them uh, specifically. Oh, and then there are two quotes here, but they are gone. <laughs> um, yesterday, uh, this uh, publication came out, uh, and it's uh, the story of Musa. And Musa is from Senegal, and uh, he was uh, arrested in 2015 when he was only 16 years old. Musa tried to explain that he was a minor. He didn't know what happened to him. In the prison, he said uh, he had two scans to, to determine his age. One assessment found that he was a minor, one did not. Because the results were inconclusive, he was placed in an adult prison for many, many years. And he says he was not, not alone in this. He remembers other young African migrants his age and younger in prison with him. My last slide <laughs> is, blank, is a blank sheet because um, the um, investigate will continue. Um, also in Greece, there are uh, many stories uh, like this and Eli Zotu is investigating uh, this. We also filed with the whole team a FOIA request in 16 European countries and we are waiting for the results, of course. Um, and when we do have, uh, we can put everything in more context uh, than we already did. Um, so the story will be uh, continued and um, yeah, these were our first findings. Thank you. Well, you, yes. 
Thank you for talking us uh, through this. Um, um, you do many things, uh, multifaceted, but this one is very much fo focused on, on migrants. Why did you choose this topic? Yeah, we started this topic um, in 2017 uh, because um, uh, the chief of Europol said that 10,000 children were uh, disappeared uh, within Europe after registration. So it, they were um, in, in our bureaucracy. Um, and that was just a news item. And then our team said, okay, um, we can go with the news, but we can also investigate what happened to them because we, we don't know that. And that is how yeah, Lost in Europe started. Um, and um, now yeah, we see that there, is all, there are criminal networks, but also legislation that uh, uh, comes to them. So yeah, we keep on investigating this topic. Are you driven by, uh, you're, 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 you are all journalists, right? Uh, lots of the team do also many other things. Um, are you driven by impact of your story? Do you, is there something that you really want to change with this? Uh, we want to shine a light <laughs> with as much impact as needed uh, to this, uh, for this problem. Uh, yeah, so that is why we, we work with, with the biggest news organizations there are in, in, uh, in Europe um, and uh, try to get journalistic impact. Yeah. What is the, what is the biggest challenge here uh, to, to get the information or to, to find uh, the information that you need to, to follow up? Is, the, is there, is there a, a huge... Uh, uh, is there anything working against you? Yeah, that is trust. Trust uh, by uh, migrants themselves, trust by their, their parents. Uh, many uh, children don't want to be found, uh, and their parents, their smugglers, and also the governments uh, don't care. Um, and so we need to uh, ha have their trust. We need to have trust from uh, people, aid workers uh, who work with them, who, who see the wrongdoings but don't dare to go to journalists to, uh, to talk about it um, because their, their jobs are on the, on the case. But also the children we speak with, uh, they see us as the same. Yeah, they tr don't trust the media because in their countries where they came from, they also don't trust the media. So why would they trust us? What, what can we do for them? That, uh, yeah. do, you, do you talk amongst each other how to break through that and, and uh, what strategies would you apply to that? Yeah, yeah ma many uh, journalists in our team are uh, also DART fellows, so they, they um, are trained in, in, in uh, trauma-aware interviews. Um, and yeah, we, we talk about uh, how we can uh, protect children who we bring into the media uh, that, it, that doesn't have uh, a life long story with them that uh, so we keep them anonymous and and so on yeah. if you if i look at lost in europe and the team that is behind it there's photographers there's writers it's a very uh, broad approach to 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 uh, to to work on this uh, topic did you have that in mind from the start or did it grow on you um, we, yeah, we, we dreamt about it, <laughs> um, and we are still dreaming. We, we are now in 12 countries, and we aim to be in 26, 27 European countries. Um, so yeah, we, we, we dream big, uh, but we, do, we know that it, it takes baby steps to, 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 to grow, and we grow with the speed of trust, because not every journalist is capable of, of being in a long-term uh, relation with, with us, so uh, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the, the ways you publish it, it's, uh, you showed a couple of them on the screen. Uh, I wrote down many different publications, lots of partnerships. Is that uh, on purpose? Do you, do you need this broad range of uh, publishing partners? Yeah, yeah because um, police investigations into the disappearances of, of child migrants uh, go towards the border and not very much into another country. So there are a lot of leads um, going cross borders. So yeah, with working together, uh, sharing leads uh, where one investigation stops and the other uh, starts um, is, is, yeah, th that is our core business, uh, as I say. And 
also, uh, yeah, you, you need to understand because every member state, European member state, has his own rules, his own legislation, the, uh, his own way the uh, reception centers are carried out. And sometimes I say to, to our Greek uh, journalist, uh, oh, this is very strange how you do this. And she said, no, it's just normal. It's, uh, it, uh, some people, um, migrants, are sentences for those sentences of 20 to 30 years. But this court case only takes one hour. So in one hour, it is said to you, OK, you go to, uh, to, uh, to jail for, for 30 years. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is not something that we would do in the Netherlands. But uh, she said, no, this is, this is uh, the, the fast jurisdiction that we have in Greece. It's very normal. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand all these, these things. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. Local cooperation with journalists helps you to understand. Yeah, because they are there and they are specialized in their, in their country on this uh, field. Yeah. So, yeah. Financing is one part of it. Grants is one part of it. It's also in the in the light of uh, the grant system that IJ for you has that. So we will talk a bit about that when we once we've seen all the presentations. So I'd like to invite Annie Hilton to uh, to to move forward and have the presentation on the screen as well. Push the button. Oh, <laughs> oh great. Okay. Um, wonderful. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to speak to you about a project uh, I worked on with a colleague, Malia Pulitzer, who couldn't be here today. Um, so I'll speak on both of our behalfs. Um, because this project is ongoing and we're still in the process of publishing, uh, I'm not gonna detail our findings, but I will go through a project overview and talk about some of the challenges we confronted and how we tried to deal with them. So essentially, um, what we wanted to look at with this project um, is we had felt that a spotlight had been cast on the precariousness of the migration process, um, particularly across the Mediterranean, um, while less attention was paid to the loved ones who are looking for the members of their family who've died or um, disappeared. And so we wanted to focus on that. And a couple of questions that we sought to answer in this process was how do families and loved ones grapple with the disappearance or death of their loved ones whose remains they can't locate and to whom do they turn? So as we all know, um, you know, some 25,000 people have died attempting to cross the Mediterranean since 2014, which is a staggering number. Um, and this makes it one of the deadliest routes in the world. Um, but fewer than 22% of those bodies are ever recovered and fewer still are identified. Um, so this means that thousands of families are left in limbo with little knowledge of what happened to their loved ones. Um, so with this, pro with this project, we sought to demystify the process for families who are attempting to seek answers while also laying bare some of the policy failures. So when we conceived of this project, we started out with a basic hypothesis that we used as our guidepost as we were reporting and out in the field. And I'll just kind of walk you through what we had originally um, envisioned, which remains pretty true to this day. Um, so the first is that there is a policy vacuum marked by minimal cooperation among state agencies in the EU. And this we found was um, held true, <laughs> and there's a lack of effective investigation and little um, effort to contact families of the missing. Um, the res this results in bodies being buried unidentified with little respect for religious and cultural um, traditions, and as such, thousands of families in countries of origin remain unaware of the fate of their loved ones. So. Um, just to briefly walk through some of the challenges that we confronted, when we initially started this project, we thought it would be a data project. Um, and we are both new to 
data reporting, we're investigative journalists, but we're not data journalists. Um, and we quickly found out that the main data issue with this project is that there is no data. Um, so we sort of <laughs> had to conceive of this in a different way, and it became much more of a people-centered project, meaning that we sought testimonies and tried to create patterns from the testimonies that we uncovered. And this leads to sort of this, one of the challenges we confronted, which was relying on NGOs and um, aid workers and organizations as intermediaries to speak with individuals. And often we found um, because, you know, people are in situations of deep pain and trauma that there were blockages there. So, um, for example, we met a priest who shared anecdotally a really powerful story about a miner who was a sole survivor of um, a boat that had capsized and was taken into Spanish custody. Her father had been located, but he was in another EU country. Um, and despite this father being identified, the minor was kept in state care until um, the DNA results could be verified, which is understandable, but this was a months long process. And we thought that this was a really powerful illustration of how you know, sometimes policies are blind to the harms of um, migration policies. And um, this, this priest, when we asked, could you introduce us to these family members? Could you just, um, you know, provide a brief introduction so we can share our project idea? Um, said, you know, people who go through something like this are traumatized for at least two years, and, you know, full stop, we will not introduce you. Um, so not only did that really deny agency to the individuals to make that decision themselves, but it, it created a, a big barrier for us um, as well. Um, I'm not going to go through the issue of translators and reporting during COVID. I think we all sort of understand um, the difficulty of using translators who aren't uh, professional. Um, in this case, we learned very quickly that even using community members who we thought our sources, sources would trust, um, but who weren't professional tr translators, proved um, to be very difficult. Um, it created many miscommunications. It often compounded um, the pain of people having to recount stories because we couldn't understand. Um, so th that was a, a challenge as well. Gaining trust of sources, uh, as my co-panelists discussed, um, was also a real issue for us. And especially during COVID, I think, uh, you know, we've all sort of, at least I have personally, um, felt a little um, hesitant to put people in precarious situations. Um, I don't want to spread the virus. I don't want to get it. So I, I have tended to um, rely on spaces that are safe instead of intimate in-person meetings, which is really how you build trust. Um, so this was a, a bit of a, an issue that we had to sort of navigate. Um, and the last one is verification. Um, again, I'm, this was a people-centered story, and um, we had a lot of trouble triangulating and corroborating our information. So what we did do is we decided to focus on two cases um, from the same boat, so two people who'd perished from the same um, drowning. And that way we could use testimonies from different family members and also medical examination records and uh, eyewitnesses and use that to sort of cross-reference um, and because there was a really incomplete paper trail. And the last thing that, we, that also my co-panelists touched on briefly that I'll mention is that, um, of course, we confronted many ethical challenges um, throughout this process, which is, I think, um, normal for 
um, any reporter who's working with a population who's vulnerable. Um, in this case, um, you know, we're both trained in trauma-informed interviewing practices and informed consent, and this was an extremely important practice to use in, in this instance, um, not only because we we learned very quickly that people were relying on us to find answers um, of what happened to their loved ones when they met, went missing and disappeared. So explaining to them from the get-go, um, this is our role as journalists, this is our job, we, um, you know, we are unable to promise any answers, um, this is how your information will be used, this is the context in which we're asking you to speak, um, and really going through every step of the process to make sure we're managing expectations of what comes out of their participation. Um, and the other thing we came across was a lot of people sharing cases that were really tangential to what we were focusing on. Um, so one of the things that we had to do, which was somewhat difficult, but we, we, we ended up pre-screening people um, to prevent them from having to go through um, you know, their deep pain and it not being an efficient use of their time and our time as well. So we asked sort of pre-screening um, questions to determine whether these were case studies that we were interested in or not interested in, but that were relevant to um, the larger policy issues we were trying to uncover. Um, so I think I'll stop there. And um, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. <laughs> No data, nobody cares, nobody knows anything, uh, you go at it. Uh, there's a lot of stacked against you yeah. when you start that. Yeah, indeed. Did, did, you, did you find that from the start? And, and, uh, and how, how do you then do commit to it? Just, is that the, the famous persistence that uh, kicks in? I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, we, both Malia and I, um, have had this project on our radar for many years and um, have sought a way into it. And I think one of the barriers, of course, was financing as independent journalists. Um, and so I think, um, you know, the opportunity to take time and to really talk to people and build kind of a, a, a set of testimonies that um, can show some credibility that there is wrongdoing um, helped us see that this was indeed something and that we could continue. And I think we felt motivated um, by speaking to people who had experienced um, you know, such trauma and such difficulty um, be, due to a lack of policy failure. So I think we really targeted our attention on those policy issues. If you then start, then you, uh, you talked briefly about finance. You, there's a lot of things you have to do when you're independent. You have to think about what to make out of it, where to go yeah. to finance it. Yeah. Um, is, is finance the biggest challenge in this? Um, <laughs> uh, I would say uh, yes, it's one of the primary challenges for as an independent journalist, um, when you want to embark on an ambitious project that involves travel and labor, um, you know, you need to make a living. So it is indeed, yeah, for long-term investigative projects, financing is a, is a big barrier. Do you feel that there's enough financing and support out there? No. No. But thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> You're very welcome, <laughs> and 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 uh, it is uh, it is of course important to to find. But yeah, uh, uh, it's it's that's that's a challenge. There's not enough out there. There's a lot of talk about media being supported, but individual journalists not getting. What what would be the best there to to change? Besides that, uh, more grant money would be there. But what do you think needs to change in that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, perhaps my co-panelists have thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, I think just access to more funds. Um, I think especially f what I found really 
beneficial in this project was having mentors and um, people who are experts in their field who can guide the process. And I think especially for reporters starting out, that's an invaluable um, resource to have. So um, I think, yeah, not only having funding for established journalists, but those who are just starting out and, and looking for that kind of mentorship um, and financing is a key thing to provide you know, accessible opportunities. Okay. Before we go to uh, Judith, uh, what was the moment when you were on your way with this where you really found something that really, you know, changed something or that fulfilled you? I mean, we talk about challenges and barriers, but there must have been a moment also where you felt like, yeah, this is exactly why we're doing it. This is where we, it really matters. Can you, do you recall that? Or are there many moments in that process? Yeah, I think there were many sort of smaller moments. Um, I think one of them was meeting the brother of someone who had, um, you know, unfortunately drowned and having him explain step by step sort of the, the issues that he'd had um, both identifying the the body and also um, the difficulty of doing that from um, another country despite being in the EU and um, the process of the body like decomposing and, and just um, knowing that these barriers um, are real for people and being able to have that firsthand account I think um, was really key, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank Judith, you. please have the, the stand and uh, present uh, some of the work that you want to share with us. Um, I, I don't have... Um, uh, my presentation is not Do here, you? I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Help is on the, on the way. Oh, this is this one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first, thank you very much for an invitation. Um, as well as Hani, um, I worked with uh, Margot Ben on that story, and uh, she uh, couldn't be here because she's been covering the war in Ukraine for the past three weeks. Um, but she also thank you for the opportunity of presenting your work. Um, so. Um, the podcast I'm going to talk about uh, was broadcast as the first episode of the season four of the independently produced one on spec podcast. And it's called Fortress Europe is a House of Cards. Um, and the season four uh, is exploring the theme of, wall, of walls and borders, um, real borders, but also imagine and how do they shape uh, global issues. Um. So I will be starting this uh, quick presentation with a number you might have heard of um, last year, and it goes on especially as we now uh, get warmer temperatures. Um, over 28,000 mi migrants have crossed um, the channel from France to the UK in small boats, and you might have heard of also the drowning uh, last, the end of November, uh, with 20, 27 migrants uh, who died. Um, and this was also the context of the story uh, that we've been working on the past six months. We wanted to spend time and look at another part of the picture, uh, which is the extensive investment over the past 20 years in strengthening security around the parts, the tunnels, um, um, which is also maybe the reason why people seek out more perilous routes uh, to the UK. So I'm talking about the city of Cali, uh, the city of Cali has been known for the, the past two decades uh, about being, uh, as it's the closest point to the from um, the French mainland to the UK, it's uh, around 33 kilometers, uh, the channel uh, between them. And we produced uh, a documentary on how private actors have, have increased have increased sorry, their security expenses in that area and how some of them uh, benefit from French and UK public funds to help prevent migrants and refugees from crossing the English Channel. I mentioned France and the UK because due to a long list of 
treaties and protocols over the past two decades, there has been a lot of uh, UK public money uh, given to the French authorities uh, to, um, to prevent those crossings. Um, so I'm talking about, uh, concretely, it means fences, it means walls along the roads or the coast, barbed wire, security agents, different type of cameras, thermal scanning uh, system, but also carbon dioxide monitors, and so on. Uh, and those expenses go through multiple year contracts and not so much oversight in case of misconduct or abuse. Um, the range of private actors that are involved, it's quite different. It goes on from multinationals um, like Total, Thales, but also small and medium-sized businesses that work in the region. Um, the thing is that we produced a radio documentary, so we didn't want to lose our audience and have just a range of numbers, years, and um, and, uh, and places, uh, so we also focused our audio story on three examples and places I will quickly uh, detail. Um, so first, uh, over-secured private parkings in the zone of Transmark. Uh, it's where truck drivers from across Europe and outside the European Union can stop for a few hours or the night in parking lots and many migrants, especially the poorest ones, they stay around there and they try to jump onto trucks and hide it also. Um, so after talking uh, with a young Sudanese that filed a rare complaint uh, at the French police claiming that he had been beaten for, uh, from, by three security agents uh, that found him hidden in a truck, we reached out to uh, a British chief a parading officer in, a, in the very same parking lot. And it explained us how um, security and searching services have been an indispensable part of his business. So I will just have a few, uh, one, just one clip um, from, the, from the podcast. Um, no? You know? uh, you have to start. Is it in the No, no, I said. Okay. It's called Madden Calais One, I said. Ah, okay, okay. Um, we ha so this is the vehicle security checklist that the UK Home Office requests for all the truck drivers and the vehicles that go through the ferry or the ch of the or the port of Calais. Um, if a migrant is found in the vehicle, you have a fine of two thousand. Uh, yeah, 2,000 pounds each for the driver, but also the transport company. So that's why the Stuart Martin I'm talking about, the guy from the private parking, is also proposing truck drivers to, do, uh, to pay 50 to 100 euros to do a quick search in the truck. And it's not like a small truck, it's like big transport trucks. Um, well, I'm not sure, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to continue. Uh, we also, secondly, we looked at private security agents that are hired to do security checks, security checks, freight searching, and look after migrants that have been found around the port of Calais or the Eurotunnel, and they are escorted to short-term holding facilities that are also run by private companies. Um, and we, many of them, many of those security agents were hired uh, by a company called Imascorp Solutions, and uh, this is a French company founded by a French former police officer, and he's currently they are currently biding for the renewal of their uh, some uh, subcontracting lot with the UK Home Office that uh, who they've been working with since 2011, and uh, it's quite a lot, it's um, like around I don't know how, like uh, total um, a few million euros, so it's quite a sum. Um, and finally, the part uh, so that is the example of one of the contract they've been um, to do. So as you can see, right there. And finally, um, the part of Calais we itself uh, is exemplifies the history of how such a big infrastructure can be a ground, uh, can be a nature and a ground for testing new tech and regulation from the French and the British authorities to curb migration. 
So in Calais, you have just opposed immigration controls and what they call lorry detections by the border force, so the UK border force, and contractors. If migrants are found in traps and concealed in vehicles, they stay first in the control area of the port and then they call the French police to go take them. And I also had just another sound clip from the president of the port of Calais who explained us exactly the process uh, they've been doing. Uh, but <laughs> uh, to add, um, so what's also, you know, so after those detailing those three examples, what's interesting um, is that, that it's part of the background um, in the UK and France diplomatic relationships especially as the UK is now out of the European Union. It's also a huge matter of domestic policy in England as it's been a political headache uh, for the conservative government and there has been a lot of um, requests, especially from U UK uh, Parliament members, to have some numbers and to know exactly how much the UK has been given to France uh, for, so long, for so many years and a lot of people in the UK are unsatisfied. They say that the French don't do enough. And uh, when you ask different authorities, and that's what we've been doing for the past couple of months, uh, just the, the numbers and even French authorities, like you have expenses, how much, are them, how much of them are covered by the UK? Um, it's the UK and France say it's two sensitive subjects. Um, if we send you this information and give you this information, it will give info to people smugglers. But after crossing and fetching a lot of documents and speaking to reliable sources, uh, we can estimate that the UK is giving and pledging also uh, France between uh, 30 and 35 million euros a year. And that does not include the, the UK home, the, the expensive of the UK home office in itself. And now we can observe that most of the, rec the recent d discussions uh, focus also on the security of the French uh, shores uh, with more patrols that have been uh, hired to respond to um, possible uh, launches uh, on the small boat that I mentioned, but also aerial surveillance, cameras, um, optronic binoculars, drones, and other at sea strategies to prevent the small boats from reaching the English coast. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, too bad. Do you have a net set? Maybe, yeah. So the first one, the first one, it's, it's Madden. So this is the, the chief operating officer site, of um, one of the biggest were, parking lots. When we bought the site, um, there was some basic uh, CCTV cameras in place. Um, there was uh, a fence surrounding the site. Uh, and that was pretty much uh, it. Um, since then, uh, we've had to reinforce uh, the fence line with um, three rows of concertina barbed wire. Uh, we have also uh, completely replaced the lighting around the perimeter. And we also have uh, motion uh, detection infrared cameras all along the perimeter. So if a migrant approaches the perimeter fence, it triggers an alarm here in the control room. We actually are currently in the process of uh, switching suppliers. Uh, the security guards will now be provided with um, body cameras. Um, they also have a, um, a tracking device so we can actually see where they're patrolling. They also have um, uh, the equipment they were being provided was a little bit better in terms of stab proof vests. Uh, because unfortunately we are increasingly seeing migrants carrying uh, offensive weapons. A part of the story told by, uh, by one of the, uh, the people you have you interviewed. Mm -hmm. I was listening to uh, one of the podcasts and um, at first I thought, uh, so we can, we can um, what do we call it, uh, we can learn about the story in many ways, but you decided for the podcast. And one of the things that uh, kind of sold it to me is that you listen to it but you put sounds in it in the in the background you hear people walking through it 
and I realized that uh, I started to see the story within my own uh, uh, mind and listening, and, and, uh, and it really gets light. That must be a challenge to, 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 to make it in a way that, uh, that it happens, right? And that you also still have sort of control over the story. What is the technique that you need to, to apply there? So that's why also we team up with Mario. So Mario is mainly a print and TV journalist, and I, I used to do radio, and I'm still doing radio, but more documentary form. Um, so when we were underground, obviously we had tons of numbers we wanted to check and processes, but I was just, because I was the one uh, recording the sounds, I was taking sounds everywhere. Like even when you don't hear a noise, like you, you just take the sound. And especially also when you're meeting with people, because sometimes they're just going to speak uh, or they're just going to tell they don't want to speak. So you just have to. And that's what also I explained um, because it's, it was quite an economic story, but we also wanted to focus on how this vast range of private and public actors um, interfere with people's lives. So that's why we include um, uh, different stories, like uh, as this young Sudanese man that I've been talking about uh, in private parking lot. Actually, after that, um, he recovered in the hospital and he was able to cross the channel in a small boat. So now he's in England. Um, yeah. There are staggering numbers uh, connected to this. I mean, you must have been blown away at one point how much money there goes to it, what happens. Uh, you try to get that across to us as an audience, but it also probably works the other way around. Have any of the, 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 the people that you interviewed and you confronted with these numbers uh, tell you like, oh really? Obviously, so when we first reached out to some NGOs uh, working uh, in Calais for some of them for a short time, but some of them for a long time, and we, um, and we begin to tell them that we're not Come, because a lot of journalists have been going to Cali for the past decade, so they're used to, and they, some of them are very distrustful towards media because they call them and they try to find them someone like for just tomorrow or after tomorrow. And when we tell them we're looking at the numbers, the public funds, the private actors, they were, oh, yeah, that's good you're doing that because it's a sense and a feeling that we have been having for a long time and we didn't have the resources to investigate. Uh, so they've been quite curious, and actually uh, last month uh, a few of the, these organizations called us to ask them to present some numbers, and also it's an, I mean, the podcast has already been broad, broad, uh, broadcast online, but um, it's the scope of our investigation continues. Um, yeah. so. uh, before I ask one more question, are there any questions from the audience? Because I'd like, to, there's one there, there's three. Now we're gonna go all the way into the afternoon. Uh, let's let's start there. I, let me let me. Uh, there's a microphone coming your way. I think yeah, there it is. Um, we'll have three questions and then uh, there you go. Yes. Hi. Probably without yeah, better. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Julie. I'm a freelancer. Um, for Judith, uh, how did you manage to convince these security people to talk to you? Because um, I mean, they have no interest in speaking on the record about all the security equipment they have there. It seems like really uh, confidential information. So the guy, the man you just heard, it's actually quite um, luck also because we called, obviously because we had that police complaint and someone telling us from an NGO that the police didn't go uh, just interview the parking lot. Uh, we called them a few times and someone there was just answering the phone and saying, no, 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 you cannot come because we've been doing back and forth trips from Paris to Calais. And the last reporting trip, we went there and we saw someone outside um, and we asked where uh, is the di uh, director's uh, office and we just went there and knocked on the door and the Stuart Madden was there and he's only there once or twice a week or a month. It depends with the COVID regulation. And he was, yeah, let's speak. He doesn't, uh, and even the president of the part, the thing is that everyone there in Calais knows the issue. Um, and we really wanted the podcast to have a, a broad range of people interview. And they're not... Um, 
he denied, obviously he denied what happened and he said that the private security agent has been fired, um, but he wanted to explain how, why it's important for him because that's the companies that, that, that the, the companies going from uh, to the UK, they require the private parking lot and to have that much security and it's part of the marketing also. Um, and um, yes. No. <laughs> uh, uh, there was the front row, yes. Uh, hi, Anne. One of the ethical issues that you spoke about that you indicated was was payment. Uh, is that is that a problem that you've encountered? And how do you get over it? And what's your solution to people who are also in that situation? Uh, yes. So we did encounter that issue in this project. Essentially, we um, were leaning pretty heavily on an activist as a source um, who had you know, deep ties with the community and family members who, um, you know, were looking for loved ones who disappeared. And after we'd built a relationship with her, um, she asked us discreetly if we would pay her um, for her time. And this was extremely uncomfortable. Um, and in retrospect, I think we could have handled it differently in um, perhaps hiring her as, um, you know, like a local producer, not that we're producing anything, or, um, you know, a community liaison or someone who we then wouldn't use as a source, but, but who could introduce us to others. Um, but we just weren't clear in the moment that that would be something that would come up. Um, this has come up many times for me in projects, um, even when I'm interviewing sources, they'll say at the end, um, well, this, yeah, this happened on one occasion, um, you know, now I'd like to be paid. Um, and I had made very explicitly clear at the beginning of the interview, um, my role as a journalist, that there would be no, um, you know, remuneration, um, and, and still it comes up. So I think, um, you know, the first thing is to just be very clear from the get-go. Um, and then if it does come up um, to explain the ethical, um, you know, barriers that would prevent payment um, and that, you know, it would compromise a journalist's independence to, to pay a source and or we couldn't use the material. Um, and on one occasion I did pay someone and I didn't use the material um, because it was such a murky situation that I just didn't know how to navigate. So, yeah, I don't know if others have come, up, come across this issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily remuneration, but as you as you say, like, what's the point of talking to you? And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, that question. We we have to uh, round up uh, this uh, this session. Uh, so uh, the question from Lutz will come uh, after. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judith, Geesje, Annie, and um, good good uh, luck with uh, the continuation of the stories. And I'm happy to follow all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, moving um, panel. Um, I was about to ask um, how to draw the line between uh, activism and journalism, especially when you are confronted with uh, children because the immediate impulse is of course to help them in this uh, situation. And, um, but I hope that we can at least talk uh, bilaterally uh, having a coffee um, about that really important question. Okay, um, the next panel is about surveillance. One of the biggest threats investigative journalism faces is surveillance. Um, this was always the case. This is nothing new, but in the digital era, of course, this, big, this threat became bigger. Uh, the recent reports about Pegasus, uh, a software that can 
be inwardly applied to any mobile phone and gives the attacker full control over the device, shocked uh, the journalistic community. How to protect sources, how to conduct uh, secret research, um, and is Pegasus a malicious exception used, uh, exception used only by authoritarian regimes, or the tip of the iceberg in a broader surveillance scheme? Um, I get the sign time out, but this. <laughs> so something is not running according to the schedule. But um, well, so we have a break until then, 10:50, right? And then we start 10:50 again. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Then I start all over again. I'm already used to it.
Dankeschön. Okay, welcome to this panel. Um, I already started moderating, but uh, and I won't repeat myself. It's about surveillance and Pegasus. Everybody knows what Pegasus is. And um, I'm uh, very happy to welcome Jamie Weissman, uh, Advocacy Officer of the International Press Institute in Vienna and also a close collaborator of the ECPMF. Um, and please, Jamie, go ahead and please introduce also your panelists. Thanks very much, Lutz. Yeah, welcome to everyone again uh, for the second day of the conference uh, and to everyone watching online as well. Um, yesterday, we heard a lot of different uh, stories about the different kind of threats to investigative journalism in Europe and around the world, uh, from slaps to pressures on journalists in, in Russia, forcing them to leave the country. Uh, but as Lutz mentioned, in this panel, we'll look at one of the other major kind of threats to, to investigative journalism, in, uh, yeah, uh, surveillance uh, and inception of uh, personal communications. Um, these kind of threats have always been around, of course, it's nothing new, uh, but in the last year or two, one kind of tool that states can use to surveil journalists has really become synonymous with, with illegal surveillance, uh, Pegasus. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, revelations, um, a lot of attention on this issue, but we still don't really know how many states around the world are using the tool uh, and how many journalists have been surveilled. Um, so to talk Pegasus, uh, what we know so far, what we don't know, um, and how there are efforts to kind of regulate and protect journalists, uh, I'm joined by two great speakers. Uh, on my right, uh, Frederick Obermeier, a renowned uh, German investigative journalist, uh, until yesterday from uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, who's been involved uh, and instrumental in the Panama Papers, uh, Paradise Papers, the Swiss uh, Secrets most recently, and of course, Forbidden Stories. Uh, and is the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize as well, co-recipient. Uh, and as of yesterday, of course, uh, an IJ4U Impact Award as well. So congratulations for that. Uh, and on my left, uh, Lisa Dittmer, uh, a advocacy officer at Reporters Without Borders in Germany, uh, specializing in expertise in, in everything from content regulation to digital security, online safety, and media freedom as well, who's been really closely following everything with Pegasus in the last few years. So thanks both for joining uh, the panel. Uh, as I said, I want to talk about um, the impact of the Forbidden Stories project, um, regulation at the EU and global level as well. But I think first it might be helpful to just kind of jump back in time um, and if you could just kind of sketch out the Forbidden Stories project, Pegasus project, what we learned, what the key revelations were about how states are using Pegasus um, and the impact on journalists so far. Well, the, first of all, thanks for, for having me, having us um, here. And wh what is the Pegasus project? It's basically a project launched by uh, Forbidden Stories and the Amnesty um, tech team. Um, and it's based on um, a dump of our list of telephone numbers who have been chosen to be targeted um, with Pegasus software. Till that data um, leak, um, Pegasus was something like a huge mysterium. So there was um, the Citizen Lab in Toronto and Amnesty working on it, having grabbed parts of the program, but not really understanding the scope where it is used. We could only understand as journalists that there's a certain danger for all of us, that uh, Pegasus could be used, for example, to remote control um, your cell phone, to read everything um, what is seen on your screen, to listen to everything that is um, spoken on the phone or even next to the phone, because you could remotely, remotely switch on uh, the microphone. But I think what was from a journalism perspective, the most important and most alarming um, thing was that we learned through the research of those groups um, that encrypted communication can basically be bypassed. The, as far as we know, the encryption is not broken, but still you can read everything that is happening on uh, your screen. So if I see somebody here like in the audience uh, having a cell phone, and for example, let's imagine um, communicating via Signal, uh, the standard uh, encrypted messenger service for um, journalists, 
while the communication on its way cannot be uh, read, but as soon as it's like pops up on your screen, it can be read. So thereby, somebody like uh, surveilling you can read whatever you communicate, for example, um, with sources. This is alarming, but in the past there was always like those talks of those companies like NSO um, or Finn Fisher um, that is only used to be targeted uh, to, uh, against criminals. Um, the classic example that those companies are normally using is the Islamist and the pedophile. Because this is, I think, what we agree on, that there is um, state authorities and state actors need to um, investigate um, such criminals. But we, more and more we realize that there is cases where human rights activists, oppositional politicians have been uh, targeted, and that traces of the software have been found on um, journalist cell phones. When we then had this list of uh, telephone numbers in front of us, that was 50,000 telephone numbers, the huge task was basically to um, understand who in this, on this list is or might be a criminal, where there might be a legitimate reason for an investigation, but who is a journalist, who is a human rights activist. And as soon as we have identified those, we basically approached them um, and were, had the difficult uh, task to not only reveal to them that we have a certain suspicion, but only to find, also to find proof. That means asking them for their cell phone um, and for their backup to basically search for traces of um, Pegasus, because we did not only want to um, prove that they have been chosen for surveillance, but really have been surveyed and being able to, for example, tell them and tell the public when it did happen. And I think that, you can, as we can all imagine, it's really difficult, like a stranger approaching you, asking like, hey, could I have your uh, iPhone back up? Uh, I have a certain suspicion, so you can imagine how difficult it was for the whole team um, to do this uh, task and do so without using your cell phone. That's the, the other difficult part, like if you're doing such an investigation, you're not able to use and have your iPhone with you because you might also be uh, targeted, so you couldn't basically run forensics on your iPhone, um, but you would have to do so on a daily basis because we learned through the process that basically the, the infection can base start every day again and again. So even if you switch off your phone, uh, sometimes the settings are like everything is erased, but on the next day, as soon as you switch it on again, you can be targeted again. So in the end, um, I think we only, as it is one of the topics for today, I think we only touched and saw the tip of the iceberg because we only have had a, a certain amount uh, of um, numbers in front of us. But what we have already found in those cases was, in my opinion, alarming. We found um, more than 180 journalists from all around the world being targeted with Pegasus. We found Pegasus being used in the divorce fight of the Emir of Dubai, um, being used, I mean, that's a typical um, private thing. Um, people are getting divorced, unfortunately, but that's how life is. Um, but it was used to target um, the lawyers of his wife. It was used to target the bodyguards of um, his wife. And I think that already shows you um, how it is used uh, in what small uh, cases um, it is already used. And it's also showing us that there's not any control function at all. NSO doesn't reveal who is its customers. Neither do the Israeli uh, authorities who grant officially an uh, export license. So it is due to leaks like this, investigations like the Pegasus Project or the forensic work of Citizen Lab or Amnesty International by getting an idea of what is happening. And I think that is where, and I think we are touching that topic a little bit later, um, where we think about what can be done. Because so far, it's a really frustrating uh, result of this investigation that we should all like take precautions, should be aware that can, we can be targeted, but that it still needs more revelations to understand the whole scope worldwide what is happening. And um, that is, I, I, I actually didn't want to, uh, want to end on a bad note, but it is the frustrating part of that investigation. <laughs> We know that obviously there have been big implications so far, in some cases deadly implications. Uh, UN investigations have seen that uh, Pegasus was used to target Jamal Khashoggi uh, ahead of his assassination. 
Um, and it's also been uh, journalists in Mexico that we've seen investigating uh, allegations of, of uh, law enforcement agencies abusing power have also um, been targeted as well. So um, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit, Lisa, about the kind of impact that this has on journalists um, and what we know so far about you know, investigative journalists in particular that have been targeted um, uh, and how they've responded to it as well. Sure. So obviously journalists promise confidentiality. That's sort of the key business of digital security in these times. We've heard it already. This investigation included journalists and sources from dozens of countries. They can't travel all the time. They don't all secretly meet in one place most of the time. The daily business of most of you here probably includes lots of people that you talk to on a daily basis through Signal, through Proton Mail or encrypted emails of some kind. It means it's your daily business to, to speak to people and entrust them through you know, basic digital security tools with a sense of confidentiality that the information shared stays between you guys. And obviously this much beyond the people who are immediately affected means that we can't have this trust anymore. It means that we always have to doubt whether there's someone listening in. And so fundamentally, I think this is not just an attack on single journalists, this is not just an, an attack even on journalism itself, it's an attack on anyone who, especially in authoritarian countries, defends their rights, their rights to, to speak to people, to freely share thoughts of any kind, to write anything down. You can't, you can't take notes without thinking that maybe someone is reading these. So basically anything that isn't just in your head likely is in your phone and thus can be surveyed. And this is sort of the really creepy thing about it. We've entrusted our digital lives with this faith that it's giving us new freedoms and now we're seeing it's actually becoming a tool of total control. And this is the really scary bit. Obviously on an immediately personal basis, I've spoken to journalists who were deeply shocked that their private lives had been targeted in the same way. They had shared private conversations with their partners. They'd suddenly become aware that any moment we most likely have our phone in the bedroom with us. This means someone listened in to the most private moments of their lives. And so I think the immediate uh, human reaction often is this, this feeling of being utterly naked. And then comes the rational thoughts of me as an investigative journalist, I have to promise people confidentiality. They will only approach me if I'm, if I'm not known to be a target. Uh, some of these journalists have gained great prominence through it, but it's the kind of prominence that they likely won't want. They want to be known maybe for the press awards, but certainly not for being an enemy of the state and being surveyed in this, in this manner. So sort of getting back controlled, on control of this field and gaining back the, the means to work in an international basis, I think that's what we're fighting for now. Pegasus is obviously a military-grade weapon. Um, it's zero-click, so unless you have your phone forensically analyzed by groups like Citizen Lab or Amnesty International, you will have no idea that it's been infected in the first place. Um, so what steps can journalists actually take to protect their digital security in, in this kind of field? Or is there any way to know? Again, you're bringing me on the, the dark side of it <laughs> and the pessimistic um, part. Actually, the frustrating result that I took out of this investigation that we cannot do much apart from li leaving our uh, cell phone um, at home when meeting confidential sources because whenever you have your cell phone um, with you, whenever you communicate uh, via your cell phone, there's a huge risk and a certain probability that you may might be targeted. And I mean, we did this uh, investigation already in pandemic times and I think we all realized how, the, the, how COVID changed our working Life. We do by far more um, work via um, the cell phone, via Teams, via Zoom, via Signal chats. And I think that is also like frightening. Like we are meeting, at least I am meeting by far less sources in person um, because of this fucking pandemic. So, um, and I think that is the, the worrying thing. So I have, don't have a so solution here, to be honest. I would recommend to regularly check your cell phone, there's very nice tools. I mean, Amnesty has a um, kind of simple tool. Um, there are simpler tools based on Amnesty's work already um, out there, and you should basically do it 
on a daily or weekly basis, but I know how our jobs are, so I'm glad when I can do it on a weekly basis, to be honest, but we should do, and I myself started like even in encrypted communication to use code words um, with colleagues and not putting names in there anymore, so it's like putting a code word in an encrypted communication already. That's like frustrating and that tells you a lot about of the state of the surveillance industry and the, the, the global threat because what Pegasus is, is, it's a weapon. It's a, it's a weapon to silence journalists and it's a rep weapon that is globally, a, 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 how do you say, deployed. Um, so that is really the shocking thing and that's why I really hope for more regulation a moratorium, I would speak specifically about um, Pegasus, really hope for the Israeli government to put at least, I mean, the, the least step that I would expect to bring more transparency in there, because I don't see a big issue, even if you would argue from the authority um, investigator side, like in revealing which countries are using NSO. Because we all know that countries all around the world are investigating criminals and that they have tools to do so also in the di digital sphere. So I don't see a, a reason why you shouldn't reveal which countries are at least using it because that also gives journalists and um, human rights um, activists um, or politicians the chance to sue a certain government. If you know that you are, have been targeted and find traces of NSO, if you know that your government is an, a customer of uh, uh, NSO, then you have at least that way open or be by f being by far more easier instead of first having to prove that the authority that you're suing is a customer while the company is not revealing it and the Israeli government is not revealing it. So I think that it could be a very first step before we do the big step. Okay, yeah, we'll definitely touch on regulation. That's a huge, huge issue. Um, to kind of bring us up to date from obviously last summer was the Pegasus project. Um, to talk about the impact of that so far, um, you mentioned there the ability to sue states. Uh, what kind of legal efforts have there been, um, you know, successful uh, ways to seek accountability so far? Um, obviously, RSF has been engaged in this work and doing advocacy. Um, so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about efforts to seek redress for, for this kind of surveillance. Sure. So RSF, for example, last summer, just a few days really after the Pegasus project launched, got together uh, 17 journalists from five different countries, including India and Mexico, some of sort of two countries, as well as Morocco, who've been especially prominent in the investigation. And uh, we filed a criminal complaint with prosecutors in Paris, as well as lodging uh, sort of official proceedings with the United Nations. Um, and it's an effort to, to, first of all, get states to investigate in the first place. You have these civil society-based investigations of what's been going on, and Citizen Lab and Amnesty Tech are sort of the leading civil society uh, digital forensics guys who have the expertise to, to really delve into what's been happening. But obviously, for court proceedings to go further, you need an official um, investigation. You need proof that um, you were actually targeted, that this was successful, that uh, this led to, to effectively criminal activity. And this is still ongoing. So, for example, the, f the French sort of cybersecurity folks of the state are, are looking into it still. Um, but the very cross-border nature of this trade is, is an issue because it's often not clear who can seek redress where. Who's really responsible? Is it just the authoritarian, uh, authoritarian state uh, deploying this weapon? Is it the company who made no efforts whatsoever, essentially, despite all the great public commitments to, to due diligence, clearly made no efforts to, to stop this weapon being deployed in the most egregious ways? And so it's, it's a tough struggle for now, and we haven't really seen any cases so far of successful redress. Uh, Finn Fischer and NSO have been known in, in sort of our civil society circles for years. We've been fighting this very issue for, for a decade now. Um, and so far, very, very little has happened. Um, the most prominent cases now, in fact, come out of the, the private sector. Apple and WhatsApp have both now sued in the US uh, NSO, claiming that obviously they make a promise to their customers that, that they're using these safe tools, and that's evidently not the case. Um, so in fact, it's now big corporates fighting each other. And this is currently, to be honest, probably our best chance of 
sort of an immediate consequence to criminal behavior that will cost them. Because th this is the issue. Uh, just a few days ago, Time once again published its sort of Time 100 list, and on its list of the most, the 100 most influential companies, it had NSO. You know, I mean, talk about defining influential. Clearly, they have an impact in the world. Clearly, they're making headlines, but for what reasons? Um, so, really, I think the the PR impact is currently probably their biggest worry. Um, but I think it will only really get painful for them if investors stop investing, and we haven't seen this happening. Yes, the, the British sort of investment fund that was involved with NSO has seen some consequences, but at large, these companies are still massively uh, profitable. And if anything, I think a lot of governments are currently following the headlines and seeing that they should maybe also buy into this great weapon that everyone else bought. If anything, there seems to be a sort of envy game now where one state says, you know, I have this great weapon, and the next one feels like they need to proliferate as well and follow up. And, and this is sort of the main issue. Some of the biggest, you know, the leading nations can, can deploy these weapons in-house, can develop these weapons in-house. This is why you haven't seen the US or Russia as customers. They probably have very, very similar programs that were, you know, developed in-house. Um, but largely, everyone's buying into this game, and, and it's not stopping, despite all the outrage. Yeah, and so Group was something I wanted to touch on. Their argument, of course, has always been that these tools are sold only to state intelligence, law enforcement, security services, uh, for the sole reason of investigating terrorism, organized crime, um, and that they've said they've canceled contracts since the revelations have been made. Uh, of course, lawsuits from tech giants, we've also seen them added to the US uh, entity list as well. Uh, so have there, has there been a change in, in practice of how many licenses they're giving out? Do we, do we know that? Or has the damage so far been more reputational than to the actual business? Well, I think this is where transparency comes in again. It's, people are having a very hard time tracking what's going on. NSO is an Israeli company, but it, it had sub-offices in the EU. It, support, uh, it claimed early on before the scandal that it had um, been granted export licenses from Cyprus, possibly from Bulgaria. Um, further names have been dropped and investigated. And it's, it's a hard time just following up on what these murky corporate structures bring about. And, and clearly, in the past at least, they were successful at, at being granted these licenses. And we've been fighting for years, at least in the EU, to make sure that that be a sort of public register, at least telling us who's being granted these export licenses, to what customers are they selling, has there been some kind of due diligence, so has anyone, either the state granting the license or the company, actually been forced to look into how this is going to be used? Pegasus and NSO might very well say it's also being used against the pedophiles of the world, it's also being used against... Uh, serious criminals and terrorists, well, then prove to us that this is your actual customer base and not everyone else. But so far, even the most democratic states are saying this is a matter of national security. Germany bought a version of Pegasus. They are saying, obviously, this is sort of a, a light version, basically, um, which, which will work within the, the remits and the burden they have in proving that this is uh, the weapon of a democratic state, which will not be abused. Um, but they're not being transparent about it either. It was uh, press investigations that revealed that our foreign intelligence service uh, likely bought a version of Pegasus. It wasn't the state clearly stating this. So to this day, we don't have final confirmation, for example, that our national intelligence service is using this abroad. We have enough sources to, to prove this is the case. Um, but despite a much more progressive government, if you want, um, that we now have in place, um, who's been critical when they were back in opposition um, of this whole affair, they haven't clearly stated that they will stop working with this company. If I may jump in here, especially the part that you mentioned, like politicians, at, at least in confidential circles, I mean, in the oversight committees here uh, at the Bundestag, they are, according to our knowledge, like claiming that there is an updated version of uh, Pegasus that is adapted to German law. But this is a claim. I mean, first of all, most of the politicians in there don't understand the technology. And I fully understand that. But I think for using that claim, 
you have to check it and you have to double check it. So there needs to be an explanation. Um, and I, I really would like to hear that explanation, how you could adopt it, because NSO, with whomever they are speaking on the record or off the record, all those statements are contradicting each other, like not only once, but like in different circles, like nobody really knows what, apart from NSO itself, what NSO can, for example, check, what they can prevent, how they prevent it, and for example, how they would adopt it to German law. Because so. just to add to this, on a technical basis, this would be the very same thing, essentially. Even if they're claiming this is an adapted version, once you're in the phone, you can't control what's happening. Obviously, the German state will say, okay, we're just using this in a very limited way. We'll, we'll make sure that all the private stuff on the phone doesn't get touched and so on. But effectively, you're allowing hackers to get into a phone. So who's to prove that it doesn't reach a Turkish level where this has really happened, that they hacked into a phone and then put files into the phone to incriminate the person who was then very surprised to find that they'd never seen this on their stuff before, essentially, on the hard drive. Um, but so you're creating a tool that is impossible to, to control. And I think once you're enabling the state to, to use a tool, why not go that little bit further? I mean, you're hunting down bad guys, so there's always a temptation to, to go that step further. So we know Germany, we're seeing more cases coming up in Poland. Hungary is this EU state so far where it's clear, or there's the most clear evidence that it's been used by its own intelligence services on journalists. Uh, Bulgaria, you mentioned as well, and Cyprus export licenses. Uh, but the EU, kind of on the international level, has probably the most uh, stringent regulation on this, this issue, right? So how can it be that even in the EU where there are these regulations, this, this can happen? Well, first of all, the regulation that we do have covers export licenses. So technically, EU states, when they grant such a license to a company, we've had this happening um, in Cyprus to NSO, Finn Fisher had been granted licenses before. Um, clearly, they have, to, they have a legal duty to, to check first where this weapon is being sold to, whether human rights violations might occur in the future. But so far, the legal loopholes were, were huge. We've seen a reform now that means that at least we have a sort of public register once a year of, of li uh, licenses granted, and that you know, gives some clues to journalists to then go a little bit further and really dig into it. And that's, that's a good first sign, but it's been a decade-long struggle for, um, for well, regulation that still leaves tons and tons of space to member states to protect their own industry. And within this whole reform process, if anything, even Germany, but many of the Baltic states, for example, who have um, an important IT industry, have been keen to, to protect their industry from overly stringent regulation rather than worrying too much about the human rights implications of all of this. So in the EU, technically, we go much further still, but on an international level, all we have is sort of um, voluntary commitments from, from a few states. And if anything, for example, Mexico had been part of this international um, voluntary agreement that there is out there, and clearly they weren't giving much um, for their legal duties that they had signed up to. Israel doesn't even subscribe to any of these international agreements. Um, so clearly there's, there's much more to be done, and Poland and Hungary using this domestically and abusing it clearly to, to target um, well, prosecutors, to target journalists. Um, well, clearly if they're willing to, to turn to the other side and, and look away when their security services are abusing such a weapon domestically, why should they care much about how this weapon is used elsewhere? So this is the, yeah, the... Dual, re uh, dual recast, uh, dual recast, yes. dual use recast regulation, so which was, yeah, passed in September last year without much fanfare. Uh, very kind of technical, uh, classic uh, regulation. wasn't reported so much, I feel, but for the first time, uh, will states uh, will report to the Commission once a year, uh, which uh, how they're kind of using, selling, trading these kinds of cyber surveillance tools. Um, but part of the issue is that it's only once a year and the, the market is very fast changing, right? So I think RSF have pushed for six months, uh, every six months. We would have loved to see monthly reports okay. or at least quarterly reports, but I think this was always unlikely to happen. But I think transparency was sort of 
the key bit where we saw an opportunity to really fight for something that might actually get through. What we were also fighting for would have been a, a proper catch-all clause, which would have meant that companies had a proper legal duty to look into, into their customers, to look into the use, and make sure that anything that isn't listed, because you have a sort of very, very technical long list published every few years or so, um, where you basically list types of weapons. This isn't just about cyber surveillance, this is about anything that can be used in a civil purpose, but also in a military sense. Um, so you have anything from sort of chemicals that can be in toothpaste but can be turned into weapons and so on, to now cyber surveillance weapons. Um, obviously, industry is saying this is just so tough to prove, and we don't know. And we've honestly heard from industry that they had a very hard time guessing at what Egypt might do with these weapons. And obviously, this is, this is really silly, and they're just letting companies off in such an easy way. But, but it's a strong argument. Um, and so transparency is the most positive step we've taken, but we would have liked to see much more binding clauses, making sure that you can't just sort of... Um, pick and choose the EU member state where you know that the authorities won't look too closely in, into what you're doing. And that's, been, that's basically been the case so far from what we've seen. Another issue was around the reasons that states can give exemptions from providing this information, right? So state security issues or commercial rights even. There are a lot of kind of get out of jail free cards here, right? Yes, endlessly so. And, and obviously, even, even a state such as Germany is saying this is a matter of national security, and if we give away which companies we're working with, well, then all the bad guys will have a much easier time evading us. Um, it's a sort of dead set argument, um, and we're having a very hard time fighting it off. Um, we'll probably go into, for example, at the EU level, we now have, uh, for the first time, an inquiry set up. It took months to even fight for this inquiry to look into what's been going on in Poland and Hungary. And yet, parliamentarians being on our side doesn't get us all that far in the end either, because we'll, we'll hear testimonies of the impact, but it's very unlikely that any of those security services involved will actually give testimony, because why should they? The governments are allowed to, to block this happening, they're allowed to say anything at the EU level covering national security comes back to the member state. And in Hungary, the, the, the sort of top uh, data protection authority already looked into the matter and found there to be no wrongdoing. A judge had been involved, supposedly, and that was pretty much it. And it was shut down within, within weeks. I, I was in, in Hungary uh, a few weeks ago. We met with uh, Zoltan Kovac, the government's international spokesman. We asked him directly whether his government would cooperate with this EU uh, committee that's been set up. And he hinted very strongly that he assumed that none of the intelligence agencies would cooperate because it was a political game of Brussels. So this uh, lack of engagement from states clearly would be a big problem. Uh, in terms of the committee, what do we know so far about its scope um, and what would, what would you hope to see come out of this a kind of EU committee? You're always getting me the, the pessimistic <laughs> questions. Um, my expectations are high, but realism tell, tells me that um, we should not expect that much, to be honest. I think the best outcome that we already have, and I hope that we get even more, is that we speak about Pegasus, that people are speaking about Pegasus not only in expert circles, so that it's not like a tech journalist's um, topic, but it's a question for all of us. I think we should even talk with our children, with teenagers, uh, about um, Pegasus and what it means, because those are the ones that are having their whole life, basically, on a, on a cell phone and are chatting and sending stuff to their friends and speak with them about it, what it means if all of this stuff is whatever tool they use, um, if it were public or known to a government, to authorities, if they want this and under which circumstances uh, they would want so. I would want to have discussions in schools and in universities about those issues, about privacy um, and what it means and how far we are going um, with the authorities, with their argument like, oh, we use it to fight um, criminals, to find uh, pedophiles, to find uh, Islamists. So I would ask those governments and those um, people using those arguments, like how many journalists, innocent journalists, do we still have to find till they start acting? How many people have to die uh, after being surveilled um, with Pegasus till they act? How many human rights defenders have to be uh, targeted till we act? I think it's all out there. The knowledge is all out there. They simply have to act. And if they do not do so, I think we shall call them, call them out. And every journalist in this room, like, hey, 
please try to find out if your government is using um, NSO, is granting expert license, do, do so if there's FOIA, meet your sources, because this all like, this is little pieces to a big puzzle, and I think the Pegasus pr project, like, if we stick to this picture of a puzzle, I think we found like the frame, the, the simple parts, um, so what you can find, like the one where there's always one blank uh, thing. But uh, now it's, I think, a question for all of us to find the other parts of the puzzle, and I think there, there's also something where we as journalists have to work together with Amnesty, with Citizen Lab, with Reporters Without Borders, because otherwise we will not understand the whole picture. And this committee, my hope, is to find at least some parts of the puzzle, to understand a little bit better the technology. I hope that they are uh, inviting those experts who went through the code um, um, to let X explain and to be explained in simple words, what does Pegasus do? And also let's speak about the consequences. Let's speak with those journalists who are affected. What does it mean for your sources? I mean, I spoke with several of them and I had the it was not fun, it was really like a difficult situation telling a journalist that you are targeted. And then realizing when they digest this, what it means, it's like, will there ever be a source approaching me? If you are the one journalist who is known to be t having been targeted with NSO, and imagine you're a potential source, would you really go to that journalist? Um, and saying that, that tells you also a little bit about the chilling effect that all those news have. Um, so I think this affects all of us. It's not only the journalists that are known now. There's by far more that are not known, and I think we should, it's our responsibility um, to fight for them because it's fighting for us and it's fighting for democracy. You spoke there about the, the EU's investigative, investigative committee, uh, but of course that's only Europe, and some of the most systematic and serious abuses have been in India, in Mexico, in El Salvador. Um, one thing that's been called for at the global level, you mentioned it earlier, Frederick, was a global moratorium on the sale and trade of these kinds of tools. It's been called for by MEPs, civil society, journalists. Um, so I want to ask both of you, in a kind of world of competing state interests, when the acquisition of this kind of technology is very much linked to security, um, and in the face of this huge and very lucrative industry, what do you think the chances are of this uh, moratorium actually coming into effect? It's another tricky question. <laughs> Answer you because then we. <laughs> so I get to be the pessimist for once. <laughs> I mean, we're fighting with everything we've got for this very thing to happen. But honestly, I mean, UN special rapporteurs. I think we have five different UN special rapporteurs now on our side calling for this this moratorium. It's not a crazy left-leaning thing to call for anymore. And yet we're very, very, very far from getting any democratic state support even. If the German government, if the French government, if or, you know the leading voices of the supposedly free and democratic world aren't calling for this to actually be implemented, aren't willing to sacrifice their own supposedly effective means to hunt down criminals, then we're not gonna see this actually materialize. Um, I think this is where we have to, to fight for things first and foremost now. We need a few democratic states come together and actually be willing to, to put their voices out there and fight for an internationally binding agreement that isn't just a voluntary commitment of a few states, but has everyone realized that the price we're paying is just too large currently? There's a much bigger debate, I think, to be had at large about whether states should hoard these, these exploits, so basically gaps in the code that, that enable tools such as Pegasus to, to find a way in. Um, all states are doing this currently. They all employ a large, more or less effective workforce to, to do this very thing. There's, there's a whole uh, trading market. In, um, there's real value, basically, to finding faults in the code. Um, and some states are engaging in this market and basically buying, buying and then hoarding these very security uh, faults, basically. And so if we don't see a commitment from at least the leading voices of the democratic world to fight for this, then, then we're not really going to see a change. I would rephrase it to be like positive now. I am <laughs> confident and hopeful that there is like small steps forward. For example, the lawsuit that you mentioned. I think there's really a chance here, WhatsApp leading the cause um, to bring more transparency and basically to show the public what happened to their customers. I do also see a huge opportunity for 
at least one government worldwide stepping up and publishing what they have found about their uh, ministers, politicians, journalists in their own country being targeted because it is, I mean, basically all Western and well, I guess all around the world authorities have the means to investigate such cases. I mean, France did because Macron was uh, targeted. Many other countries did so as well. So please publish it once an official uh, uh, investigation into what NSO can do and has done and what consequences it has, because that would be a first step. And also, I think we should not underestimate the blacklisting by the US um, government. I think that was a huge step, um, knowing that the US side, they have similar tools. And those are, of course, not blacklisted because it's their governments and they, those governments are also pretending that it's only hunting down criminals, terrorists and pedophiles. But hey, let's start here because if one side starts, maybe the other one like, realizes that they want to react. Maybe this tit for tat helps us to understand more what is going out there. And let's keep discussing those things. Speak about it whenever you can. Annoy your parents, your grandparents with those topics because only that way we can spread the word of what's happening. And ask your grandparents if they would like uh, everything what is happening in their home, um, everything that they are writing, I guess sometimes still in letters, being published and being uh, um, surveilled. I mean, it's, at least in Germany, we have bad memories um, about every letter being read by authorities, every phone call being listened to authorities, and people, uh, politicians, human rights activists being followed. That is exactly what Pegasus does. That's the uh, modern version of Stasi tools um, and Stasi um, um, methods that are applied here, not only by uh, autocratic states, but also by democratic states. I think it's a, yeah, a really good point you made that while we're really scrutinizing NSO group and Pegasus a lot now, we're not, I feel, questioning the, the entire industry of surveillance tools that are out there and pose a real threat to journalists. Um, that's going to be a major challenge in the future as well. So I just had one more question, and then maybe we can open it up uh, to the group. Um, like I said, uh, Pegasus project was published last summer. Um, there's been a lot of impact and a lot of changes and a lot of uh, development in the way people view and understand Pegasus. Uh, is there anything more planned for the future for the project in terms of investigating Pegasus in other states? Um, how, how is that looking in the future? I mean, this is of... I, I think live stream, right? <laughs> so I have to be cautious here. Uh, yes, the Forbidden Stories team is still working um, on leads. Um, yes, there are still um, tips that we are receiving. And yes, you can still check your cell phones. So, and you can approach us um, if you have an, a hit and if you find uh, an issue. Or if you, you want to report upon it um, on your own. Um, I mean, the tools are out there. Amnesty, Citizen Lab, they're happy to help you um, to report this stuff, to understand what those tools do. So go for it, um, and I'm happy to read it. All right, yeah. Uh, any questions? Uh, we have, yeah. Who's the first? Uh, I think the first one was here. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, sorry if it's a basic question, but what's the legal claim uh, from Facebook and WhatsApp against um, NSO, uh, the case you mentioned, and what's at risk exactly if, it's a, if they succeed? So basically, uh, WhatsApp and Apple are alleging that obviously this company abused a, a security exploit, basically found a, a fault in the system and abused this, and effectively that the company enabled hacking of their customers. Um, I'm not a lawyer. This is the rough, the rough version of it, basically. But obviously, so on the one hand, there's the biggest chance here for NSO literally having to pay for what they did. Um, but the worry could also be that these, these lawsuits, they drag out. They drag out over years. Eventually, you know, the limelight will be on something else. Um, and there could be a huge interest in just in settling um, and, and in settling fast. And then, again, a, a massive loss of transparency of what's been going on. Um, so at, at the moment, I think this is one of our best chances at learning more of what's happening. Also, maybe on a po more positive side, we're seeing a positive example of a company saying, we take responsibility for the security of our customers and we're actively alerting them, for example, when we find out. Because in the past, companies who promised security were keen to 
also, as positive PR, obviously, keep up this promise, even when it, it wasn't holding true. Um, so now at least WhatsApp has set a precedent that they've, at, uh, on a mass basis, basically alerted people that they were hacked, um, or that at least there was the suspicion that this had been going on, and, and that's a positive step as well. Nothing to add. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for the expositions, like, first of all. I, w I have two questions. I'm not sure if we have time for them. Just answer one of them if that's the case. Um, first one was related to the investigation itself. Like, how did you actually uh, know which governments were using Pegasus? Because I know that, like, first the leaks came out on who was targeted, but then, like, we started to know actually which governments were using it. So how did that part of the investigation uh, come? How did you manage it? And then secondly, you were talking before, for example, about how we should uh, tell our relatives and people the, about like explain them like would you like for example you being listened to in your house and so on I work for example with privacy and with digital literacy and I have like this hard time all the time to actually explain to people why it's important for them to have their private lives and not be surveilled by very simple tools that we use in, in our daily lives like not very uh, surveillance targeted to journalists so I hard I find it hard that how people will actually not feel um, like that they can be an objective of Pegasus which is like a high surveillance tool so how do you do that distinction to these people like how do you explain to them okay maybe you cannot be target of Pegasus but you can still be targeted but some kind of surveillance even though it's like a simpler one thank you very much well we had this issue like because there was hundreds of people like calling us, sending us emails, am I in there uh, in the data, do I have to fear for it? And of course, Pegasus is a very specific weapon. It's like the sharpshooter rifle um, in the, the digital world. You're really targeting one target, then you're hitting it, and the bullet is very expensive because that's really, NSO is making big money with every simple, a uh, single uh, uh, infection. Um, so that already tells you that this is not a mass scale tool because uh, uh, authorities would get broke even uh, in states that are, that are rich. But I cannot give like a good answer to those readers because there is still mass surveillance. We have learned, let's go back to Edward Snowden. Um, that's a simpler tool and that targets many of us. That is not like the sharpshooter rifle, that is, but that is basically someone in, in a shooting spree like going 360 uh, and shooting around uh, and you're not sure who is hit and the bullets are by far cheaper. So again, no nice and optimistic answer, still a pessimistic one. <laughs> and when it comes to attribution, um, I cannot, for some source protection reason, I cannot go that far, but the nature of the data gave clues who was targeted by the same customer of NSO. And from that, and then adding on, like meeting normal sources up outside the data, one could basically draw the conclusions who the customers. Okay, we're, I'm getting the timeout sign. <laughs> so just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do we have time for one more question or no? Yeah. One more. One more, okay. Okay, th thanks a lot, and also for your work and presentation. Uh, you mentioned this uh, EU com investigative committee. There is also uh, something called Situation Center, or SITSEN, in the EU that's been around for some years. Uh, it's, I don't know what relevance it has and what it really has produced, but I see that now that they're being upgraded uh, in in. Uh, with the reference to, to this new strategic compass. Now, my, I don't expect, suspect them to, to have bought uh, this equipment themselves, but if anyone has a knowledge about it, it should be those people. Uh, would, have you approached them, or would you know anything about how the institutions themselves have reacted to your reveals? I have no specific knowledge about the Situation Center, but there is, of course, officials out there who could tell us uh, how Pegasus is uh, deployed, because NSO is traveling the world like with their uh, selling pitches. They present to federal police, to intelligence services, so there are people who listen to that pitch, but unfortunately, they did not at least publicly speak out what they have learned about it. But they could be asked, but again, then the old uh, problem, imagine an intelligence officer who uh, listened to such a uh, pitch sitting in such a committee being asked, and then you're again like, oh, that's national security. You cannot force those guys. 
unfortunately, to answer those questions. And because that is also a field that um, shows us that we are huge lack of uh, accountability in this, not only a lack of transparency, but also accountability in this field. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we'll bring it to a close there. Just a quick say again, thank you, Fred, for your work in investigating and bringing these issues to light, and Lisa for, yeah, for fighting for justice for those affected. So thanks very much, everyone, and uh, I'm back. Thank you so much. Thank you. So please throw away your cell phones now, and uh, we have a break until uh, 10 past 12, and then we start with the last panel for today.
Okay, welcome to the last panel of uh, the Uncovered Conference. This is about freelancers and the condition for freelance work. Um, so back then in the 90s, uh, I myself worked as a freelancer. I had several, for 10 years, um, I had several options also to be employed. I always refused them because I thought freelancing is one of the most wonderful things that you can do. You enjoy your opportunities, you can always choose the topics and you have a lot of freedoms. You can choose with whom to work. And um, so by accident, uh, I came across my tax declaration um, just recently and I saw that from the 90s, from 1999, and I realized um, how much we earned back then. So the conditions were actually fantastic. This changed completely with the beginning 2000s. Uh, there was a disruption, as you all know, in the market. And now um, uh, freelance journalists belong to the most vulnerable groups uh, in journalism, economically, physically, but also mentally. Who is, responsibility, who, who is responsible for protecting freelance journalists? This is the main question that will be discussed now by Scott Griffin, Deputy Director of IPI, who will introduce his guests now. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Lutz, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final panel of this uh, Uncovered Conference. It's been really interesting so far and looking forward to getting into this uh, last discussion with our speakers this afternoon. As Lutz said, uh, this panel is about uh, freelance journalists and who is responsible uh, for, uh, for protecting them. And as, as Lutz said correctly, um, we've seen in, in recent years a trend uh, towards a more precarious situation for, for all journalists, but especially for freelance journalists who lack the institutional support of media outlets in many cases. Uh, and this precarious situation extends not just to the financial side, uh, but also to, to the safety side, uh, both in terms of physical safety as well as increasingly online safety if we think about online attacks. Um, and the fact is that uh, you know, journalists working for media outlets uh, often have access to uh, greater resources uh, to protect themselves uh, if they face these types of, of challenges. So uh, what we're going to talk about this afternoon is uh, a little bit about the challenges that, that the specific challenges that freelancers face here in Europe, but also uh, the solutions uh, that do exist and different uh, projects and opportunities uh, that we have to, to give support to freelance journalists. And I just want to mention that support for freelance journalists is something that's also very close to uh, IJ4U, something close to our heart. Uh, and in fact, uh, this year of the IJ4U program, we launched a new uh, fund within IJ4U specifically for freelance journalists. Um, uh, that's, the free, that's the Freelancer Support Scheme, which is uh, managed by EJC. Uh, and uh, we funded 15 different projects this year involving freelance journalists, cross-border projects, uh, amounting to about 260,000 euros uh, in grants with team members based in uh, 16 countries. And what's important to note about uh, the freelancer support scheme is that it's uh, what we call, as, as uh, EJC, as uh, Lars mentioned yesterday, it's a funding plus model. Uh, so it's uh, financial support for the ability to do journalism, but also other forms of support, especially uh, networking and mentoring. So uh, having said that, let me briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, we have first with us uh, Renate Schröder, who is the director of the European Federation of Journalists, which represents uh, over 300,000 uh, journalists in 45 countries in Europe. Uh, we have Gurkan Östoran, who is the uh, project manager for the Media Freedom Rapid Response, uh, which is a coalition of different press freedom organizations, including IPI, EFJ, ECPMF, uh, which tracks, monitors, and responds to media freedom violations, and also provides legal uh, and practical support and public advocacy to protect journalists, including freelancers, of course. Uh, and finally, we're very happy to have Anastasia Kirilenko, who is a Russian uh, freelance journalist now working in Europe. Uh, until 2014, she was uh, a staffer at Radio Liberty in Moscow, and since then has been based in France, uh, working for several different media, including uh, the Insider and Media Part. She also co-produced an investigative TV documentary on Putin and organized crime. So uh, a welcome to all of our panelists. 
I want to start with you, uh, Renata, uh, if you could help us set the stage a little bit uh, in terms of the situation for freelance journalists right now uh, in Europe, the challenges uh, that you see from, from your view at EFJ, uh, and a little bit about the solutions. What, what, what can we, how can we concretely support freelance journalists? So thank you. If you allow, I will stand. It's the importance of the theme. <laughs> Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very sco much, Scott, for the introduction. Thank you have, for having been invited here to this very important uh, meeting. Um, I can say you talked about the 90s. I've been working now for the beginning of the 90s for almost 30 years for the European Federation of Journalists. And since the beginning, I have specifically followed our freelance expert group, which is a group of freelance journalists and freelance organizers from our unions. You mentioned the figure of the journalists we represent, and we represent them through national unions and journalist associations, actually in all Council of Europe member states, plus Belarus, and now I have to add plus Russia. We still have a very small union trying to survive in Russia. Um, when I started my career, another point I, I wish to mention today, because one of the first seminars I attended and organized was a seminar in Berlin, and the name was The Future is Freelance. Actually, I have to say, looking back to these 30 years, no, it's not yet the case. Many of our members have more over 50, 60 percent freelancers, but in the Nordic countries, for example, it's 12 percent or less. Some countries, some members are losing freelancers because they are leaving the profession. So we may still say today the future is freelance, but at least it hasn't happened so far. But I think for most young journalists to start the career, indeed, as freelancers, most of the time with a very precarious status, as Lutz mentioned, especially because we failed a market, a market failure in journalism, media houses throughout Europe and globally are cost-cutting by reducing their newsrooms, by outsourcing, we all know it. While we still have journalists, still today, who choose to be freelancers, unfortunately, many have been forced to work as freelancers, often called false lancers. The contributions of freelancers in the newsroom have become irreplaceable. I think we all agree about that. Their working conditions, however, are not adapted to the importance of this work. The European Journalism Center launched a survey. They will map the current landscape of freelance journalism in Europe and identify challenges and opportunities for their empowerment. Their preliminary findings, and um, I was happy to have a look at them, actually match very much with what our members tell us. And it will be useful to get them published and discussed then by all stakeholders. As Lutz rightly said, the media employers specifically have a special duty of care. In the following, I just wish to discuss, as Scott says, some potential solutions to the, and I list here five obstacles, of course there are many more, we face in better protecting and sustaining freelance journalists in Europe today, with some good practice at the end, so we get out of the seminar not too depressed. So first, and probably not surprising, the very low fees are seen as some of the main challenges for freelancers to stay in journalism. Especially in small markets or at local level, when only one big media sets the scene and the price, it is extremely difficult to get something we call fair remuneration. The majority of respondents of this EGC survey completely agree with that. 57% are indeed extremely concerned 25% are concerned. Our unions have been producing fees recommendations. They have launched freelance calculators to compare salaries between um, staff journalists with the fees to set for fair remuneration for freelance journalists. These freelance calculators are interesting, but hardly implemented. Unfortunately, one obstacle here besides the fees recommendations and the ability to do collective bargaining on behalf of freelancers, 
are the competition authorities who regard freelancers, believe it or not, as commercial entities setting the prices. Fortunately, the European Commission only recently has recognized this absurd approach and it is right now trying to rectify it with hopefully some guidelines to be published soon that will allow collective bargaining for solo self-employed and also fees recommendations by unions and association of journalists. So we are very much looking forward to such guidelines. The second point, social protection for freelancers. The European Commission's, and I don't know if it has, if it has been said already, maybe yesterday, um, adopted a recommendation on ensuring the protection, safety, and empowerment of journalists and media professionals in the EU last September. And it includes freelancers and all those, and I quote, working in non-standard forms of employment, which are more and more, to ensure accessibility to formula and effective social protection and other practical support measures. And let me continue to quote. The recommendation says, in particular, member states should continuously work to strengthen access to social protection against unemployment, sickness, invalidity, disability, and professional risks. And this should include freelancers. But as these are only guidelines, we will need a lot of power the unions, but also other organizations to get it implemented. We have to put pressure on governments, on media organizations, so that these recommendations don't stay, as we know, in some files and are not being looked at. Third point, young journalists, not only young, also older, are not equipped to be a small business. They need training, they need training on taxes, on how to do it, on being their own publishers, which is a great opportunity if it works, and much more. Our bigger union do such work. They organize webinars specifically for freelancers, but governments should provide more support here as well. In many countries, we have weak unions and associations who are just not able to do that. And as we heard yesterday, the challenge is sustainability. The fourth point is legal support, and I think within these two days we've heard a lot about that um, as well. Often unions deal with legal support, but they do not always have, again, the resources of working on freelancers' behalf. Actually, today, free, the work on freelancers take most of the resources of our unions, who are the weakest in the chain. They often face author's rights or contract problems, violations against the protection of sources, slap, we name them, also for investigative journalists working cross-border under different legal regimes. It is indeed a challenge, and I'm sure you all know that. And the fifth and last but not least point is the issue of safety, and I'm sure we'll talk about that further on, safety and protection for freelancers. Again, the EC recommendation includes that media companies should empower all journalists, including freelancers, to take part in safety training, also regarding online harassment. This being costly can only be afforded by larger media, by many public service media, but smaller regional media and freelancers in particular cannot do it themselves and they do need financial assistance for safety training, including digital security. And I have to say European Union is doing quite a lot there, but it has to be done at national regional level as well for investigative journalism working on organized crime and corruption, this can be life-saving. So yes, media organizations have a duty of care towards freelance journalists who are ever more on the first lines, be it during demonstrations, protests, and I'm sure Gürkan will tell a little bit more about all the attacks recently our freelancers have faced, also at little protests in our democratic countries. Life-saving jackets and helmets are a sine qua non during wars and unfortunately become almost as important during protests and demonstrations within the European Union. But let me refer also to some good practice. One from Germany with the so-called Schutzkodex protection code that has been recently adopted to which several, though not enough, media houses have committed themselves to. 
this codex, which includes commitments to psychological and legal support, training and other practical support mechanisms, includes expresses verbis freelances. It has been initiated by both German unions, the DJV and the DJU in Verdi, by RSF and two other media organizations specifically working for the protection of minority and women, because it also includes protective measures against online harassment and hate speech. There are other regional initiatives helping freelancers to face hate speech and online harassment as well. In several countries, the public service media provides insurance, safety training, and a contact point in the country where they send their freelancers to. And the EBU has told us that safety has become a priority for their work. Our Dutch colleagues have done some best practice by creating Persweilig, I may not pronounce it well, um, Lars, which is a safe hotline where journalists can report when they, they are confronted with aggression and violence. It is a hotline, but it's also a help desk. It offers training courses for journalists to help them become more resilient towards physical violence when they have to deal with aggressive people in the streets, but also online. And Pers Weilig recognizes that they have a special duty of care for freelancers. In short, if we do not get support mechanisms extended to freelancers, the weakest element in the already very weakened media ecosystem, we may fail to support an ever more important sector. Freelancing is booming and deserves all our support. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Renata, for, for setting the scene for us, and uh, we'll come back uh, to you with, with questions. But let me turn now to Gurkan, who, as I mentioned before, is the uh, project manager for the MFRR, uh, which is tracking, uh, in particular, attacks on journalists, monitoring different threats uh, to journalists, including freelancers. So it would be great if you could share your perspective on this, uh, the challenges that journalists, but especially freelance journalists, are facing. We heard also you know, protests is one issue, but where else are freelance journalists being especially challenged? Um, and the types of support that uh, programs like the MFRR are able to, to provide. Thank you, Scott. So I would like to first uh, start by saying that I started working as a freelance journalist, then I became involved with a newsroom, and I was a manager, I hired people, I worked with freelancers and staffers, and there has never been an easy position uh, in any of these angles. It has always been problematic for me in the last 15 years, but uh, what I can say uh, confidently is that situation has been getting worse and worse over the years. As uh, Renato also uh, pointed out, it was projected that uh, freelance would be the future, but sadly freelance seems to be a dying future, unfortunately, for, uh, under current circumstances. Uh, over the last few years, I have been receiving many distressing calls uh, from many different countries, from uh, various journalists. Some of them were working for uh, established newsrooms, some of them were working for uh, public broadcasters, and some of them were freelancers uh, working for different institutions. And there was one thing uh, that was common for all of them, that uh, they were all feeling forsaken when uh, faced with a challenge, when faced with a kind of attack, or when they were neglected uh, in the field. And the attacks or uh, the targeting of these journalists, be it physical, online, or uh, some other form, uh, or being denied uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, right that they should be enjoying, in all these cases, the most impacted ones have always been the freelance journalists. They were all uh, stating that they were feeling forsaken right after an attack in a, uh, any of these forms, but the freelance journalists were feeling the biggest pressure in all these cases. For them, lack of uh, working with, a, with an established team, having regular support from their uh, colleagues and co-workers was the hardest one. Just a couple of days ago, I was moderating a panel on slaps and I interviewed several journalists who were being subjected to uh, slaps. And in these slap cases, the journalists were stating that, two of them being uh, freelance journalists, they were stating that when the police showed up at their door to deliver them uh, the court papers, they personally did not feel the emotional impact, but their immediate surroundings. 
that their neighbors were uh, anxious, that their children, their family members, they were the ones who were getting also impacted. So when a freelance journalist is left uh, by themselves, this does not only forsake them to this treatment, but also everyone else around them. In the MFRR, uh, what we have been doing in the last couple of years is basically based on the premise that when we see or hear something, we are responsible for this. When there is an attack or when there is a, when there is a problem related to journalists, this means it must be monitored, it must be mapped, it must appear on the map so that we can uh, reach out to this person and offer support in any form possible. This can be in the form of practical support, this can be in the form of legal support. We have been talking about this in the last couple of days, but also, very importantly, the psychological support. The psychosocial support is usually uh, forgotten in the, uh, in the workshops and meetings that we are holding with uh, journalists and journalism associations uh, in different parts of Europe. We have been talking to people, and in many cases, sadly, we have been hearing that, oh, but it comes with the job. It comes with the job when you get beaten at a protest. It comes with the job when your newsroom uh, says that you have to gi give up your protective gear. It comes with the job that you get traumatized a bit. It, gets, it comes with the job that you get harassed online. No, these do not come with the job. They should not be normalized. And unfortunately, many journalists uh, consider setting a strong image against these kind of attacks as uh, being protected enough but uh, this kind of denial against these attacks would not, be, uh, would not create a healthy environment. At the MFRR, uh, we have been receiving many, many uh, alerts from across Europe. Just this year, uh, a few months ago, we have passed uh, more than 6,000 alerts uh, that have been recorded since 2014. And uh, of all these thousands of attacks, the uh, majority of them have been journalists who have been subjected to violence while covering dem demonstrations. Last year, it was the top, uh, top issue. And when we, uh, when we hold mis uh, missions, fact-finding missions and uh, fast reaction missions in uh, different European countries, we talk to journalists and they are, uh, they are telling us their experiences, what they are facing uh, during these protests or demonstrations that some of them uh, state that it is uh, the police forces or security forces that are targeting journalists, and some of them state that it is, uh, it is the participants of the demonstration that are targeting them. And there is no easy angle to approach this either, because uh, when we also talk to uh, security officials, they, they state that journalists must be marked, they should be introduced beforehand, but uh, not every journalist is working for a newsroom which can grant them a press card, or uh, even though some of them are working as individuals, as freelancers, when they have, in uh, brackets, uh, some of them also register with uh, the International Federation of Journalists and hold an international press card, which sometimes cannot be recognized uh, by the local officials that are treating the journalist in, uh, in that instant. And this is creating a problem, that there is no standard response. And uh, while some journal, uh, journalists are stating that it is the demonstrators uh, that are threatening them, so they are hiding their cards, then uh, in the next step, it becomes the security officials that say, but if this was a journalist, they would be carrying a valid card and they would notify us beforehand that they are a journalist. So uh, just like uh, there being no angle that is easy to approach when uh, looking at the financial uh, support for the freelance journalists, there is also no easy approach to, uh, to a freelance journalist being uh, targeted during demonstration coverage, or uh, just like we have heard in the past week during the MFRR summit, that multiple journalists uh, gave their testimonies about uh, their online presence and how they gave up their uh, online activities uh, as a total, aside from publishing their own articles uh, and laying low. Feeling this solitude, feeling this forsakenness should not come with the job. And for that reason, uh, in addition to the practical support mechanism that we have initiated at the MFRR, which can come in many forms such as equipment support or financial support, healthcare support, we have also initiated uh, the psychosocial support, which uh, also involves uh, 
counseling with a uh, uh, counseling with a psychological expert or uh, a meeting with a clinician or it can be peer to peer support groups uh, where they can discuss because over the uh, over the last couple of months uh, during the webinars also that we have been uh, organizing we have come across multiple journalists stating that they feel completely isolated that this is targeting only them that they do feel that they are the only person in the world that is uh, feeling this way at the moment, which is not true. Sadly, there are many, many people who are being treated in the same way. And in these uh, support groups, uh, journalists can share experiences and uh, they can pass information and uh, experiences with each other that can teach, uh, that can become a teaching moment for all of them. And, uh, Again, I'm going to re repeat what has already been said, but uh, the legal support remains to be one of the strongest elements in the MFRR that uh, thanks to the MFRR's uh, legal support and uh, also um, some other institutions as well. Journalists who do not have a chance to defend themselves by themselves can uh, be equipped with uh, the legal protection against uh, especially overwhelming uh, legal cases that are targeting them. And this feeling of forsakenness, I believe, can be broken by support mechanisms established uh, for journalists involving media freedom organizations. All oh, right, yes. <laughs> the associations, I believe, would include the unions. <laughs> but for the moment being, I should perhaps let also uh, everyone else to have a chance. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, Kukan, for, for that overview. Um, indeed, let's uh, come now to, to Anastasia. And um, we've heard a lot about now about the, the situation on the ground, situation for freelancers, the different challenges uh, that freelancers face. Uh, and I wonder whether this rings true for you. As I mentioned, you've been working as a freelance journalist in Europe for about eight years now. Um, does this match uh, your experience uh, in general? And then obviously I want to come a bit later to your experience as a Russian journalist in particular, but in general, uh, has this also been, are these sim some of the challenges that you've faced as well? <clears throat> yes, indeed. Uh, so I should say I, I started in Russia. Uh, my best investigations were uh, did when I was a freelance. So my first one uh, it was undercover investigation in 2007 when I was 33. I recorded a training of people uh, falsifying elections. Russia. I don't know why nobody from staffers uh, did it. And after that, I had security issues. And my, well, the media who published it, uh, they just told me, uh, <laughs> please go back to Moscow, because it was not in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. I joined Radio Liberty as a staffer. Um, so I did one investigation now quoted by Navalny in his famous movie uh, as a staffer and another one already as a freelancer. Um, and uh, this uh, second one, uh, it was about, um, um, you know, I interviewed a man who said, uh, I bribed Putin, Putin had a possession in my business, and uh, well, he gave some, some proofs and I did an, um, additional checks. But uh, Putin's spokesperson, he criticized the investigations even before it was published. Uh, a year later, same thing happened to Panama Papers. And Radio Liberty, they uh, took down <laughs> the article saying it's for security concerns. And uh, Roman Dobrakhotov from The Insider proposed me to join, uh, saying that we, at least, we, we don't take down uh, articles. Mm, and uh, so this is why I started to work for The Insider. In the meanwhile, um, Crimea was annexed, and um, I was a little bit proactive uh, moving to, uh, to Europe at that time. Because already the situation in Russia was going worse and wor getting worse and worse with the freedom of speech. I remember I had conversations in 2014 with people from Nova Gazeta and Piedmosti at my kitchen, and they were optimistic that we have something like bad, but also new media appear that I was not, and so now I'm 
uh, glad that um, like like I prepared the soil because the Bureau of Radio Liberty is closed in uh, Russia. Nowhere Gazeta uh, doesn't publish anything about war, etc. So um, about my experience uh, at cross border uh, with cross border journalism. Uh, it was, uh, well, I, I did something, as you mentioned, uh, this movie about Putin and uh, links to organized crime. Uh, but in this, uh, this is my work for The Insider, uh, which allowed it to, so The Insider became like a source uh, primar primarily for Russian uh, mainstream media, like, uh, or almost mainstream, like Echo, Echo of Moscow, TV Rain, Russian independent media. Um, and uh, but also it allowed me to to do a research in depth for a documentary, and it was in another another story to get it published even with a contract signed um, in Scandinavia. Uh, fortunately, the production company was independent from French television, uh, so it was aired first I, I think in Scandinavia, in Denmark, uh, Sweden. Um, so it even came to Germany, but in Germany, uh, to, uh, CDF, a uh, very strange uh, thing happened. Uh, they advertised the documentary a week, uh, a week before the premiere, saying for the first time we uncovered uh, how uh, Putin is uh, uh, actually controlling organized crime in Russia. But in the day of the uh, premiere, another documentary was shown, and they said it was technical error. <laughs> They apologized, put it on the website, but still, uh, you know, this convenient technical error, we still don't, don't uh, completely know, uh, don't know 100% what, what happened. In the process of preparation of this documentary, I was even approached by bad guys, let's uh, say, let's say, they first insulted me, saying, "We are, uh, tell us we, uh, who is the man behind you, because we are sure a woman can't be a real author of uh, your article, uh, your articles, and what uh, you are doing. So we want to talk to the man behind." <laughs> so <laughs> it was very uh, strange, and they uh, proposed me even money in, in a very rude manner. Uh, what will be the cost of positive solution or something? So finally, indeed, we decided to to go to a, meet, a meeting with my co-author, man, <laughs> <laughs> and we recorded it uh, to have a proof, and uh, because uh, potentially it, it is dangerous, I, I think. So I received a strange call also from. Uh, from a man who is officially a banker, but obviously linked to Russian uh, security services, uh, Bill Browder mentions him is his um, uh, mentions him uh, in his book as a problem solver. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, yeah. He, so this man uh, based in London approached Bill Browder. Uh, saying uh, I can help you to, uh, or something. Of course, he, Browder said, uh, "No, please, uh, <laughs> I don't need it." So this man um, called me and saying, "Oh, you're Russian. Uh, how c could you do uh, this? To you are not patriotic. I don't know what." So first he tried. Um, uh, when you receive such calls, in fact, they try uh, different techniques. Uh, in the same time, th they say compliments. Then, when it does uh, doesn't work, uh, they insult you, <laughs> and uh, so so it happened this way. I recorded this call also in case, and I informed m my editor in chief of this documentary. But of course, uh, globally, I. Uh, don't feel uh, somebody protects me um, ex uh, except myself. Uh, so I just follow the, um, I don't know, guidelines of, of what is uh, obvious to do. For example, uh, you know, when journalists were killed, it was never uh, like uh, somebody is calling uh, you, I will kill you. No, it, it was... Uh, um, I have a great uh, information for you. You are uh, so brilliant person. So please meet uh, somewhere to receive, uh, to, uh, so I can give you this information. Um, 
and uh, uh, so I communicate uh, uh, more or, la or less confidently with people I found myself, and when it's vice versa, somebody is saying I have great information for you, but I can't uh, tell you my name because of security reasons, so I answer exactly because of security reasons, uh, me either, please uh, use uh, any form except personal meeting to deliver what, what you have to deliver. Um, so some messages I even received on, on, on WhatsApp, but actually it was people pretend to be journalists, but for example, they, they say the name, but not the media, or only the media without saying the name. And uh, well, when uh, there is something strange, I check with uh, the media they mention, and not everybody was journalist <laughs> who contacted me this way. Uh, so it takes some time to do additional checks. Um, and also, I can't uh, think about it uh, every day, but we, we should not neglect, uh, neglect uh, threats. So probably I, I would say one day a week of uh, counterintelligence work uh, or something uh, in terms of time, uh, it's uh, unfortunately it is needed. Thanks very much uh, for, for sharing all of that, uh, Anastasia. I want to just uh, stay with you just on, as a quick follow-up question. You, obviously, you mentioned you left Russia eight years ago. Um, now, because of the repression in the country linked to the war in Ukraine, uh, we're seeing larger numbers of Russian journalists leaving the country. Um, I was wondering uh, if you have sort of insight into uh, the situation or the challenges that Russian journalists now in the EU or trying to enter the EU are facing, uh, especially freelance journalists uh, and, and what we can or what can be done to support them in your, mm -hmm. from your perspective. So the, the challenges, of course, are, are true financial and how to get better visibility. Uh, unfortunately, only because of the war in Ukraine, um, mainstream media and some investigative uh, European media became more interested in Russian corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, some topics I was proposing years ago, like why we have a French enabler uh, in Bank Russia, which is Putin's bank, only now there is a, a good uh, atmosphere uh, to push forward uh, these investigations. So, so I would say that this is very sad for me. Um, it's like uh, the cross-border uh, journalism failed because we failed to prevent this, this enormous war. Uh, when, um, when I was speaking to some, uh, to, to some investigative media, uh, I was even asked, uh, so Putin, uh, yeah, you, you say Putin is corrupt or he is rich, but probably has, he has a right to be rich. So I have to explain all the contacts in Russia and uh, that officially Putin has um, a Lada, so car Lada with a trailer only. It was <laughs> repeated by state propaganda uh, one week ago that sanctions uh, Putin is not afraid because he has only Lada with a trailer. Uh, it's a quotation of Russian state media. So, so uh, even explaining all the context and why, for example, uh, uh, put the so-called Putin oligarchs are uh, uh, from security services. Why the, is it matter? Why are we sure of, of it? Uh, it took uh, it took years, <laughs> basically, to, to get the, the message uh, passed. Um, you know, in, but now, as I said, the situation is uh, evolving uh, for for the better. Uh, at least uh, we, we we should push uh, forward investigations of Russian corruption and even slash funds uh, based abroad. Uh, we had many whistleblowers on it who are uh, starting to speak more about and they are already based abroad. Uh, in London uh, we have at least 50 you know, refugees or uh, oligarchs who, who some of them are, are shocked and uh, have uh, things to say. Uh, so um, uh, I'm for um, this view of, of global journalism. If uh, sometimes uh, you can learn about Russia more uh, from abroad than uh, from inside, 
because people who have uh, things to say uh, uh, and to show documents, that they left Russia. Not only journalists, uh, whistleblowers, uh, former uh, business partners of Putin's friends, uh, uh, they are all, all now uh, on London, in London and on French Riviera. Um, some, of, not everybody of them are, uh, are corrupt. Uh, some of them say we were uh, obliged to participate in something because otherwise it was not possible. Um, and um, I know that at least 150 journalists left Russia because of the war. Uh, but many of them left before, like Roman, he left in, in September uh, of last year when his passport was already um, uh, took away. Um, it was also um, several years preparation to, uh, now we un understood to what to this war. <laughs> uh, journalists uh, were evicted I would say evicted or pushed away from Russia, and uh, so the, uh, from my uh, po point of view, the challenge is to, well, to cooperate. Uh, probably, uh, as a staffer, it's possible for some investigative media as project, uh, but many uh, of. Um, Journalists would, uh, f for sure, uh, only remain freelancers because, uh, like you know, uh, your radio is closed. You, you don't have a, an immediately a, a position of a staffer, especially when you are based in Paris. Um, and uh, they would need, of course, a support. Uh, some of uh, the journalists of Radio Echo of Mos Moscow, I saw they started YouTube channels because they can't remain, uh, remain silent. Uh, so they just uh, started uh, this um, <laughs> broadcasting uh, to, uh, just to be heard uh, somewhere, and it's crucial to support all, all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe just staying very briefly on the topic of, of Ukraine and Russia, um, you mentioned the duty of care that media outlets have towards freelancers. Renata, uh, if you could just tell us Briefly, from your perspective, what you see, I mean, we're talking about a war zone on, on the edge of Europe, in Europe, um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of media outlets, most, most media outlets in Europe, most freelance journalists uh, don't have experience working in, in war zones. Um, how do you see the situation in terms of um, the preparedness of freelance journalists in particular to go into a situation like Ukraine? Uh, are and our media outlets um, fulfilling that duty of care when it comes to freelancers? Uh, what are you seeing at the moment in, in that sense? Well, first of all, we all know that there have been um, six journalists killed in, um, in the Ukraine. It's not very clear, and in the end it doesn't matter who has been a freelance or not. There has been a fixer from the Ukraine, when some employer sort of take some responsibility, be it Fox News or but two cameramen who are, who are um, freelancers. Nevertheless, what we can see is a complete unpreparedness for this war, I think, and we share the responsibility, all of us, nobody for some, whatever reason, thought of that. And of course, the freelancers are the first ones who the young people want to go there to make a name, to become famous. We have always had that, uh, war reporters taking this opportunity and not being prepared at all. This is not news per se, but Ukraine being so close and many freelancers um, going there, we have been actually surprised, specifically from Italy, from Greece, how many journalists left there. We know it because we have, at the IFJ, we have this safety fund, but we also have an insurance um, when going to risk. And these, of course, first of all, are the freelancers, and we had a lot of requests, specifically from Southern Europe, interesting to say. So that also shows that the duty of care has not been taken so seriously, because the first thing when you send somebody, be it a freelance or a, a staff journalist, is an insurance, is a, is, is, is a helmet and a, a life jacket, and that's also something we realized. We, were, we got some money for that. We send it there. But it's like with the masks. 
we didn't find them. I mean, it is just they had to be done. Nobody was prepared. And just a life, it costs about 1,000 euros. So no freelance can afford that. That is a problem, let alone a, a first aid kit, uh, let alone all the, the preparation in terms of safety, as I mentioned before, public service media putting pon contact points there. INSEE, you may know about them, the International Youth New Safety Institute. They, you years ago, did a declaration where they had 10 points, specifically mentioning also freelancers, what is needed when you send your journalists to war zones, and what is the duty of care of the media organizations. Several media organizations have signed that declaration. I think it's now our work to really look what's happening, if they take it seriously or not, because I cannot tell you which, I, we don't even know who is in the Ukraine. Huh? There is a lot we don't know. We know there have been journalists in the east. We're trying or our people to help them going to the west where it's more it's safer and, and, and all that, but there is a lot of gray zone there and a lot of um, unknown information. At the same time, I think it's a learning experience. I'm sure, and I hope there won't be another war soon, but this will be a long war, so people are learning people are taking it more seriously from all sides. But we have six journalists already killed, and I don't want to think about who else could be on, on that list, because we also know that there have been, or we figure there have been some journalists specifically targeted. Um, Kirkan, how, from, the, from the perspective of M MFRR, how, how are you responding to the situation in, in Ukraine, uh, especially when it comes to journalist safety? Of course, we're talking about freelancers, but, but in general, um, what, what possibilities are there? Regarding MFRR activities concerning Ukraine, uh, sadly, MFRR is uh, mandated to focus on the European Union member states and the candidate countries, but uh, this also includes journalists who enter into Europe or one of the candidate countries and uh, is under risk. Over the uh, past month, we have received many calls from journalists uh, that were coming from outside of Europe or outside of the MFRR mandate zone, but ending up in the EU or in, uh, in one of the candidate countries and uh, asking to be, receive support. And uh, we do not say no to these uh, applications, of course. It can be a, a Ukrainian journalist, it can be a Belarusian journalist or a Russian journalist. And here I would like to underline the fact that uh, when looking at Ukraine and when we are declaring solidarity with Ukraine, we should definitely not uh, exclude independent Russian journalists and Belarusian journalists and uh, activists and anti-war people coming from these countries. I sadly have been seeing uh, some uh, anti-Russian, anti-Belarusian sentiments uh, over the past month, and this is uh, not heading for a good place, I must say. And when offering our support, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is significant to consider uh, not to discriminate. And in this regard, uh, again, I would like to give reference to the MFRR summit from last week, that uh, during our spotlight interviews, we were interviewing Ukrainian and Russian journalists. And we have been bringing up uh, the support for journalists, uh, regardless of what country they originate from. But looking at Ukraine, it is uh, sadly turning into a much worse situation. And over the past decade, we have seen many wars. We have seen uh, what has been happening in Syria, a disaster. And uh, in Libya, in Afghanistan, we have always seen journalists, and uh, especially freelance journalists, getting into very dire situations. And only last year, we were receiving calls from journalists from Afghanistan. Uh, they, the ones who could make it to Europe, they were reaching out to us to ask for support. And again, uh, just like with Ukraine, we have been doing all we can to support them as well. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have been monitoring uh, the alerts in Ukraine. And as Renata also put it, sadly, there are many, and there are six murders. There are journalists who have been abducted by Russian forces. There are journalists who, has, who have been forsaken to their destiny, basically, by newsrooms. And newsrooms, uh, at this point, I would like to again underline that newsrooms cannot deny their responsibility by saying, but they were freelancers, they are not our staffers, we don't have to do anything to save them. 
No, they have to advocate for, uh, for them to be saved. That uh, they cannot be avoided. And I would like to return to uh, the sentiments concerning uh, Russian and Belarusian journalists. Uh, at MFRR, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have issued a statement, an advocacy statement, calling for the EU to uh, process easier applications from journalists coming from uh, Russia and Belarus. And uh, in this regard, uh, again, uh, one of the MFRR activities is to uh, carry out ad advocacy statements, be it based on trial monitoring or uh, reaction to ongoing developments. And it is a comprehensive support system that uh, is pr uh, proving to be effective. And unless it is all interconnected and intertwined, uh, it is leaving uh, some parts outside. Yeah, sorry, I've just got a sign that we only have two minutes left, but if it's okay, I'll take a few questions from the, I think we started a bit late. Uh, yes. Um, you, you briefly mentioned it, but one of the major issues which has come out of this war, and in general, is the status of fixers. Is there a way to somehow regulate this, to empower them, to give them the status of co-journalists, to give them byline justice, to give them a fair salary, to open up the transparency of how much they're paid, and to actually bring this rather sort of gray work into a more kind of uh, 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 conventional and respected uh, situation? I can just quickly say what we have been saying since the beginning, fixers are journalists and they have to be protected as journalists. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question in the back. Hi, I wanted to find out if uh, there's been any movement on, you know, um, giving freelancers uh, help with liability insurance, uh, either through newsrooms or uh, through other ways? I can only say again that the IFJ has this insurance mechanism and, and they are trying to give preferential um, status to the freelancers, but you have to be a member of a union. Um, and some of the unions have tried to have their own. It's not an easy one. So, yeah, have a look at the IFJ insurance for, for journalists. And in addition to that, I would like to say I can only speak for Turkish uh, example, of course, because that is where I come from and that is what I have seen so far. Some independent news organizations have been offering these uh, insurance mechanisms for freelance journalists. Even though they do not pay full salaries, they are allowing them to register with their news organization so that they can benefit uh, from being registered as an employed journalist in the system, which enables them to obtain a press card as well. Thanks, Kirkland. Uh, maybe we have time for one last question, if last question of the day. <laughs> may I add the most of course. Answer? If I may uh, add about fixers, because I worked as a fixer, um, for example, in France, when it's the state television, they uh, employ fixers as journalists. So when uh, there's a report on air and the fixer, uh, there is journalist, cameraman, and fixer, or, or all three names uh, in the signature. But uh, the private uh, companies, yeah, they disregard uh, fixers. Uh, he may be even not mentioned. Uh, and um, as for now, uh, because of this war in Ukraine, uh, jour uh, French journalists uh, uh, try to save uh, every, to, to exfiltrate every fixer uh, step by step. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, but it, it was, I have an impression, uh, their personal initiative, you know, to visa support all the staff because they had some contacts uh, uh, with the authorities, uh, etc. At, at least they did it, but not uh, at any official level. And regarding fixers, uh it is important to remember that news is much uh, more and beyond what we see on the screen or uh, the signature under an article. So at MFRR monitoring, we do uh, monitor the cases that involve journalists, reporters, correspondents, uh, editors, writers, columnists, media workers in general uh, working for a media organization, including fixers and uh, other uh, extra staff that are involved with the production of the news. 
That's why we have all also Council of Europe recommendations on safety is for journalists and media workers. And I remember the Russian Federation refused to sign this Council of Europe safety recommendation because they don't, didn't want to have the term end media workers. It has been signed now because Russia left the Council of Europe. But and that's for that. We have even expanded the journalists in residence program to include the families of journalists who are involved uh, with this program. But, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, in, in Russia we have many laws <laughs> even that journalists uh, should uh, have a professional uh, education. They try to uh, impose this uh, law. I think that they failed, but even here in Germany the situation is not uh, uh, just a, a case from, from my career. Uh, I published uh, a, a story with uh, Frankfurter Rundschau und uh, R&D about uh, Russian money laundering uh, through the shipyards in, in uh, Germany, uh, in East Germany. Uh, I, so I, I sent a request to the prosecutor's office and they answered me, uh, prove that you are a journalist. Uh, uh, where is your press card? Uh, in, so uh, in Frankfurt I was uh, said even, oh, it's Eastern Germany, we are sorry. <laughs> we will try to, to fix her. <laughs> To, to fix uh, this problem. <laughs> so much to talk about. Unfortunately, we have to, to wrap up. Uh, but thank you so much to, to all three of you for sharing these uh, perspectives. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to all of you for listening. Niels, thank you. Right, so thank you very much for the last panel of the day. I'm afraid that's it. We need to wrap up. But before, I would like to have some concluding remarks. So, Scott, if you can stay here. Lars, if you want to join us. And then uh, Lutz will also have some concluding remarks. So, Scott, do you want to start? <laughs> Since you're here. I, I have now I have double <laughs> microphone. But <laughs> uh, no, uh, just uh, concluding remarks, I think. Yeah. Uh, from, from my side, I think it's just been fantastic. It's been a really interesting two days, uh, fantastic uh, discussions, and really great to see, in particular, uh, the investigations of, of some of our IJ4U grantees uh, this year. I was really, yeah, impressed, as always. Um, and uh, also, I think it was just great to be back in person after an online version of, of the IJ4U conference last year, so that uh, was really great. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank EZPMF for organizing uh, this, this Uncovered conference. Um, I'll keep it short, but, uh, but yeah, I think it was a really interesting, again, a really interesting two days, great discussions. Thanks to all of you for being here, and thanks to those online for, for watching as well. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, all of you. I have, uh, have listened uh, to all of you. I've learned a lot. And uh, I must also say I'm very impressed by what I've seen and what I've heard. And I think it's also uh, a great uh, testament about this big cooperation that we have and the, the push that we have for ij for You to be really out there and to make sure that the investigative journalism is, is uh, seen and on the map. Uh, I heard uh, this morning uh, Mrs. Jurova say that uh, the effort for investigative journalism is there for Europe, so I'll promise you we will hold her to it. Uh, but l knowing her that uh, we can trust her on her word uh, for sure. I, I hope that you can all uh, keep up the good work and uh, we will do our best to facilitate, help, support anything that, uh, that you do. And, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to keep seeing the work that you do, the funders that fund it and, uh, and all the, uh, the, the things that cir circle uh, investigative journalism. So yeah, well done, thank you very much. Yeah, I also have to thank uh, everybody, um, especially the grantees. It was amazing um, to follow their research and to, to uh, see the results, so I couldn't stop really listening. Uh, this is what is journalism all about, and this is close to our heart, and this was really, this was really, really impressive. Um, when in the preparation of this conference, we talked to a lot of journalists also to see uh, where are the problems, where are the challenges. We talked a lot about threats, and we talked a lot about pressure and uh, things like that, but there was also one positive thought that uh, at least one investigative journalist uh, uh, said to us. He said, well, the demand for investigative journalis journalism is rising. Because in a society where you have a lot of bullshit, like disinformation, entertainment, PR, you name it, 
there is something that provides the value of journalism, and that is investigative journalism. And obviously, also publishers understood that, because this is the only thing that they can sell, yeah? Real journalism. So maybe in the future we talk about different conditions and we do not only talk about threats and pressures, but we talk about also the renaissance of investigative journalism. This is the hope that I have at the end of the conference. All right, so thank you very much to all of you, to the grantees, to um, speakers, to the audience here and online, and also thank you to the staff of the European Commission's representation in Germany. We've really enjoyed this venue and we hope to be back very soon. Oops. Yeah. And last not least, thank you to uh, our collaborators uh, uh, within the IJ4U grant. Uh, this is the EJC and uh, IPI, of course. And thank you very much, uh, the ECPMF team, uh, that made this possible. Uh, first of all, it's Denise who was organizing all that. <laughs> She's our IJ4U uh, manager, and she did really a wonderful job. Thank you, Denise. Um, also, Andreas Lamm, where is he? He's always somewhere hiding. But without this guy, it's impossible. Um, we have the uh, press team uh, present uh, with Jordan Higgins, who is sitting over there. Uh, I also have to thank Flutura. Everybody knows Flutura, I guess, our legal advisor. And, of course, Gurkan, who took part in the last panel and who was also moderating uh, from time to time. Gurkan. <laughs> so, I wish you all a good day. Stay safe. Hope to see you next year in an even bigger conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.